<laughs> Hello, Joe. And that I think you hit a, made a comment before you hit the live button. That's kind of crazy. What is up, Manuel? Let's see. I'm gonna come over here. See if I can bring you up on my laptop over here. All right. Cool. All right, setting everything up. Go 12 hours. <laughs> Maybe I will go 12 hours. I don't know if my voice can hold 12 hours. And at the end of this, I'm actually going to have to make another video for tomorrow. I still have that video to do. Hopefully, my voice will actually hold out for those. What is up, Hector? Ooh, a whole bunch of comments already. What is going on? How's it going in general currently for you? Doing pretty good here. The snow is starting to melt. Everything's getting swampy out in the barnyard. So I have like half snow and half swampland out there. So that's kind of frustrating. But other than that, doing pretty good here in the reptile room. Uh, do I have a Morph Market or Facebook page? Yes, I do have Morph Market. As a matter of fact, you can actually go to any of my videos. And if you expand the description underneath my videos, You'll see a link to my Morph Market page, and you can follow me on Morph Market, although I don't have anything posted over there right now. But uh, as a matter of fact, I have quite a few followers over there, so when I post something, a lot of people kind of jump on it really quick. I didn't even know you could follow people on Morph Market until just recently. Should I try for a panda pie? Yes, I would definitely go for the panda pies. Uh, you know, one of the things I've always thought, you know, with the Panda Pine, you actually have the super black pastel and that can tend to have some genetic defects with the super black pastel. What I would actually do is go for like an eight ball pine, which would be like the eight ball version of the Panda Pine with the, uh, the combination of the cinnamon and the black pastel in the pine. I would think you might have less of a chance of any genetic defects with an eight ball version of the panda pie. Are house snakes the next best, th the next big thing? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, I, I don't know a whole lot about house snakes, but I don't think there's a whole lot of different morphs from house snakes. So I think that's the, the thing that really keeps ball pythons going strong. All right, lots of comments. Uh, do I make more money from snakes or YouTube? Believe it or not, I make most of my money from YouTube, which is pretty amazing. And keep in mind, I actually have about 1,200 videos over on YouTube. So I've been doing it, pretty much putting out a video every single day for about three years now, which is, which is kind of crazy. I don't know. I'm thinking about maybe doing everyday videos for maybe 10 years to see where I'm at. Hopefully I'll be like uh, up to like a million subscribers or something in, in, in another, I guess it'd be like another seven years. I think maybe I could get to a million subs by then, which would be kind of crazy. Hi from New York. All right. What's going on? I bought two ball pythons inspired by your channel. It is very addictive. <laughs> I tell you, once you buy two, you buy a whole bunch of bunch of other ones. Usually, you really get deep into it. Uh, let's see, how heavy and how long should a one year old female be? So it really depends on the female. I'd say probably my best females at about one year old or anywhere. I'd say probably the best you could probably expect is anywhere from like 800 to 900 grams with pretty heavy feeding. But I've actually seen some one-year-old females that are just a few hundred grams. So it really depends on how often you feed them, how big the rodents are, and how well they will actually eat. So let's see. Uh, let's see, you need a co-host. Huh? <laughs> yeah, if I had someone else here on the live, then I wouldn't have to talk so much. I might be able to do it 12 hours if I had a couple more people. Although, yeah, it's a little bit difficult when you have more than one person on the live. Sometimes people can be pretty unpredictable as far as what they're saying on your YouTube channel. Uh, let's see, are you interested in wild snakes or just pet snakes? So, yeah, so I actually started my very first snakes that I actually caught in the wild, which were garter snakes when I was just a little kid, when I was growing up in Wisconsin. But now I pretty much stay away from wild snakes because especially since I don't really want to bring anything like mites into my collection. So I pretty much stay away from the wild snakes. Let's see, I like to say your videos are awesome and very helpful. This is my first time breeding. <laughs> Uh, let's see. 
the more fun making has not been made yet. I want to ask, how should I price it? So that is a very good question. So I kind of ran up against the same thing when I was making some of my bamboo combinations. I'd make a combination that was never made before, never seen over on Morph Market. Sometimes you can get kind of an idea. So for example, if you have like a multi-gene combination using you know, a whole bunch of genes and lesser, sometimes you can drop the lesser and see what the price is. Or you can add something like Mojave, something similar in the blue red cystic and see if anyone's made something similar with a similar gene that's maybe in the, in the blue red cystic that's priced the same way. Sometimes you can get an idea as far as that. And sometimes you just kind of have to guess if you actually make something brand new. All right, lots of comments. All right, love the channel. What do I use for filming? <laughs> so right now I'm actually using my Galaxy Note 9 cell phone for doing my live streams. No microphones or anything, just my phone, which is kind of crazy. I have my phone up on a tripod and the tripod is a little mount for my camera. So it actually has kind of this like swivel, kind of a, a it's like a swivel mount up on top of my tripod. But for my regular videos, what I actually use is all the, everything I use in my videos is actually posted underneath every single video. If you expand the description, you'll see my camera, my tripod, the, the SD card and everything, all my lighting and everything is posted underneath my videos. As a matter of fact, that was like one of the biggest questions I had when I started out and I decided just to, to put them under every video so people can find it. Just started, got three babies, awesome. Hi, Chris, I have a beautiful female bamboo. Congratulations, given the bamboo is so dominant, what would be an interesting combo? So, so keep in mind the bamboo is in the blue-eyed leucistics, so you can make the white snakes. You could actually, uh, the calico bamboos is one I really like. Uh, you can actually do a bamboo lemon blast. Anything with the pinstripe and the bamboo is pretty awesome. Uh, like bamboo spiders, bamboo womas are pretty awesome, anything like that. Uh, what did you do to make your channel better known at the beginning? <laughs> How did I get my first followers? So it's kind of interesting. When I first started my channel early on, what I actually did is I started breeding ball pythons and I would go to the reptile shows and I have a whole table of, uh, I would actually rent like a, like a, like an eight foot table and I could hold about 60 hatchlings on my table. And I just have one table at the reptile shows. And then I was printing out a business card and on the business card, it was all about my YouTube channel. And on the back of the card, it actually had a link to my YouTube channel. And it was kind of interesting after every reptile show I'd, I'd hand out maybe like anywhere from 50 to about 100 cards every single day it was really expensive to do it but i got I, i'd say pretty much at the beginning that's how i got a lot of my followers right from the beginning of course now i probably get i think i'm getting like 40 subscribers every single day so at this point it's not really worth actually handing out cards i don't think it would have that much of an effect versus you know the pros and cons of handing out cards at a reptile show it's pretty expensive to do it. but if you're just starting out a channel i would highly recommend it you can grow pretty fast that way are the hypo and ghost the same if i breed a het hypo and het ghost well i get a visual yes yeah, so the hypo is the ghost the hypo is a slang for the ghost and keep in mind there's actually different lines of the ghost so depending on what lines of ghost that you have I'd say pretty much your most common ghosts are all compatible unless you get into there's there's some there's certain ones like I've actually heard of like the like the green ghost or the butterscotch ghost or there's there's a certain ghost there's certain lines of orange ghost that aren't compatible with the other orange ghosts and the majority of all the other ghosts so sometimes sometimes it can be incompatible but I'd say most of the times hypo and ghost are interchangeable and they are compatible uh, I think scaleless corn snakes are the next big thing. <laughs> yeah, so because scaleless corn snakes used to be really expensive, which is kind of crazy. Hi from Pueblo. What uh, what is up, Christopher Combs? I know who that is. <laughs> what is going on? All right, let's see. I built the sweetest enclosure, and my ball python got out of the smallest crack. It's amazing. Yes, yeah, so snakes can really squeak out of the smallest cracks. You have to be really careful of that. 
Uh, let's see. I have a 1400 gram female. That's why I was concerned. Uh, where does Bobby sleep? So Bobby is the ball python I have around my neck. He is my eight year old bamboo ball python, eight year old male. This is Bobby and he sleeps in an ARS 7030 tub right over here. As a matter of fact, right as soon as I pulled him up, I went through my whole, all my racks and everything. I was spot cleaning. And then I go over and pull Bobby out. And of course he makes a mess right before I pull him out. So I'm gonna have to go and spot clean Bobby's cage over there. That's pretty much where he sleeps. And then, you know, in the evenings, he's pretty much around my neck every single day doing YouTube videos. Uh, 1400 grams at just over a year old. Yeah. So that is a really big female. That's been, that's been eating really well. And you've been feeding it for the, the 1400 grams at a year old. That's really unusual. I'd say, you know, if you actually have like a 1500 gram female at two years old, that is pretty unusual too. Sometimes it can take more than two years to get them up over 1500 grams to the breeding size. And I'd say typically I'd be about 800 grams at the first year. If I'm lucky, I'm about 1,500 grams on the second year and I can breed them. How big are your hatchlings when you move them out of the hatchling rack? That is a good question. So when I move my snakes from one tub to the other, I kind of look at the snake in a coil. So like in the back of the tub, what I do is I move all the substrate from the back of the tub and then they're, they're sitting like directly on the plastic, which is directly on the hot spot. And if they coil up on that plastic and the, the sides of the tub are really close to the sides of the ball python where they're almost touching from side to side, that's the time when I move them up into another tub. I definitely don't want them too big where they can't form a really nice comfortable coil coiled up on the hot spot. Hey, we got a super chat. Thank you for the super chat. <laughs> super chats feed the cows. I have four cows, and let me tell you, they go through a lot of hay. So it's like I'm gonna have to do a hay run this week, which is kind of crazy. All right, let's scroll down. I'm like way behind on these questions here. I'm way back, but I'm just gonna go through slowly this time. So uh, try to hit all the questions. Yesterday I was like skipping ahead. I think I missed like a hundred questions yesterday. Wow, we got another super chat. Thank you. All right, let's go to the first super chat. All right, Don Muse. Hey, Chris, love the work you do. You offer better perks per level on YouTube fan. Uh, so, so yeah, so I don't really have anything as far as, you know, as far as Patreon or the YouTube membership. I don't really offer any kind of a perks other than you can help me support the channel through your support. But the other, the only thing I really do for Patreon and my channel membership is I put you at the end screen of all my videos. So if you wait till, you know, at the end of the video, when I say, all right, I will see you in the next video, like right after that, I actually have this little screen that pops up with all my current and past channel members and Patreon supporters, which is a really big list, which is pretty amazing. That's pretty much the only thing I do. But as far as, you know, you're kind of upping your the level that you're at, it doesn't really bring you any other perks. All right, Jay Quinn, thank you for the super chat. I got a male ivory leopard and a female ivory enchi. Wow, that's awesome. What other females should I look for? So, so yeah, so, so the ivory is the super yellow belly, which is an all white snake. And really the only two genes that can break through the ivory as far as the pattern is the the leopard and the enchi so when you bring them together you'll get some enchi leopard ivories which would be a pretty amazing combination and what i'd actually do is i'd work those into like some of your like highway or freeway projects you can also go after like the pumas and the super stripes anything in the yellow belly complex that's allelic with yellow belly you can work those into those snakes which would be pretty awesome and since you have a male and a female that's pretty powerful because it doesn't really matter which one you're actually getting a male or a female when it's if you got like an asphalt or something all right so yeah so uh <laughs> what's up my animal house hi all what's cracking i believe what i know <laughs> <laughs> I like that name. That's pretty cool. What's up, Rodney? My albino escaped. Oh, no. 
Uh, what do you think about the red gene? Yeah, so I've been looking into the red gene. I haven't done a video on the red gene yet. That is one that's still on my list that I haven't done yet. I'd say there's probably maybe about two dozen genes that I haven't done a morph review, and that is definitely one of them. Uh, have I been in the military? Yes, I was in the 101st Airborne back in the day. What is up, AJ Genetics? All right, let me go back. I skipped a whole bunch of questions way back here. Where does Bobby sleep? Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. What would you breed to a super fire female? That is a good question. So super fire contains two copies of the fire gene. Hey, I just noticed, James, thank you for being a big fan. I appreciate the channel membership. Cool. All right, so the super fire contains two copies of the fire gene. It's an all white snake with black eyes. It's a black eyed leucistic. So what I would actually do, you could breed that to another super fire and make a whole clutch of super fire. Keep in mind the super fire, the all white snake, pretty much nothing can break through the pure white of a super fire. So you produce a whole clutch of super fires and they're pretty, I'd say you get some pretty good money for super fires. It's, you know, it seems like the all white snakes are increasing in price. I think, you know, the last time I looked, they were anywhere from probably $300 to $600 a snake or something like that for a super fire. So that'd be pretty cool. And then keep in mind, if you actually work fire into pastel, you get the fireflies. And the fireflies can really keep their brightness and the yellow color as they age and mature. So you can make some... Uh, some firefly combinations. You can also work uh, fire and pastel into your azanthics. And the, the fire and the pastel can really clean up your azanthics and make some really amazing combinations. Hey, we got another super chat. Thank you, Mike T. All right. Love the channel. That's snake related, but I see people saying go 12 hours. Have you gone 12 hours? <laughs> yeah, so I did a, uh, as a matter of fact, I actually did a uh, live stream marathon and I did three of them in a row. I did three 12 hour live streams in a row. I went 36 hours in three days, which is crazy. I had this crazy idea. I thought, you know, let me, I was going to actually do this live stream and use the super chat money to help pay for a Harley Davidson because Harley Davidson was struggling and I wanted to support him and kind of bring awareness to the Harley Davidson brand. And it didn't really work out. That well. I pretty much lost my voice after three days. And the money that I raised was only a fraction of what the Harley Davidson was worth. So I ended up selling a bunch of snakes, but I still bought the bike. And it was crazy. I'll probably never do a 12 hour live stream again. I don't think my voice has been the same since I did that 12 hour live stream. All right, what would you price Super Emperor Kryptons at? So, yeah, so when it comes to the Kryptons or the Cryptic, I don't think there's a whole lot of combinations out there. So when you're actually don't go with, like, other genes in with the Kryptons, it, 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 I would say it's pretty expensive for a combination. And the prices are probably all over the, the place. I'd say it's probably... I think the Kryptons are selling for at least a thousand, fifteen hundred just for a Krypton. And then when you add other genes into it, I have to look at the pricing. I haven't looked at the pricing on the Kryptons for a while, but I would imagine something like that would probably be worth more than a thousand dollars, something like that, just because it has the Krypton in there. Hey again from Scotland, what is up? Completely and totally random, but you might like pine snakes. Yes, yeah, so I pretty much stick only with ball pythons. Uh, let's see, was I in the military? Yes, I was in the 101st Airborne. To kind of date myself, I actually signed up for the 101st Airborne back in 1984, back before there was computers, before there was cell phones. Before, the, I don't even think there was pagers back in 84. <laughs> we were still kind of huddling around the phone booths. That was a long time ago. Probably longer than some of you guys have been around, which is kind of crazy. Uh, let's see. I picked up a bamboo pastel yesterday. Yes, pretty awesome. 
All right, Kyle, I bought what was, what was said to be a leopard head clown from an expo. I got home and got looking at it. It looks more like a common. Uh, so, yes, yeah, some of the clowns can look kind of like a normal ball python. Usually, you know, you'll have a clown by the head stamp on the top of the head. So if you actually look at the top of the head on your ball python, if it has a really crazy pattern on the top of the head, then you'll know for sure you have uh, well, it's actually, well, that's uh, a, a leopard het clown. Okay, so with just one copy of the clown, you won't be able to see the head stamp. And sometimes the leopards can look really close to normals too. You, normally, your leopards are a lot darker than a normal. So it really depends on how dark the background is on that sink. If it's really super dark, I'd say you definitely have a leopard. <laughs> But sometimes it's hard to tell. So sometimes <laughs> I've actually done that before. You buy something at a show and then you start questioning it. And then when you start breeding it into other combinations, usually for sure you'll know because you'll produce some pretty amazing combinations if you have those genes in there. Uh, let's see. How are you today? Not many people ask how you are. Yes, I'm having a nice day. Pretty good. Not too bad. Uh, I have a bamboo double head ultra mel pine. Wow. Yeah. So I would probably find another ultra mel pine to breathe that to if you can, or like a pine head ultra mel or an ultra mel head pine to go for the ultra mel pines. Those are pretty expensive if you can actually hit it. And then you have bamboo in the mix. That would be pretty wild. So keep in mind if you actually make a bamboo pine. The bamboo pines are, I believe, a completely white snake with kind of a gray head. So that might kind of completely mask the ultra male in your combination, which would be kind of weird. You might have slightly different colored eyes if you hit the bamboo ultra male pied. You could probably tell the ultra male maybe from the color of the eyes in that combination. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Da, 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 da. All right, let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, if you have two male ball pythons that are used to each other and friendly to each other, can they be in the same enclosure? Well, I know from my experience when I'm breeding my ball pythons, I accidentally put two males in the same tub when I was breeding them in breeding season. And let me tell you, it sounded, it sounded like my whole rack was shaking. They were fighting pretty bad. And I don't know if they can actually hurt each other if you put them together, but you might stress them out to the point where they won't eat, which may be an issue if you enclose, if you have two males in the same enclosure. But I've seen people where they, they actually have multiple snakes in the same enclosure and they, they claim that they do okay, but I would worry that they go on a fast longer than individual snakes in separate enclosures. All right, let's see. Tarantula Nirvana. If there weren't so many ball python morphs, do you think people would own so many of them at one time? No, definitely not. I think that is the one thing that sets ball pythons way ahead of all the other snakes and all the other reptiles is the number of genes, the number of morphs in ball pythons, and the fact that we keep finding new ones every single year. If it wasn't for that, yeah, people would definitely not <laughs> keep so many ball pythons. It's, it's kind of crazy. If you look at like, you know, I actually started with like California king snakes, and a lot of times, you know, you're breeding a desert phase to a desert phase, which is the black and white California king snake, and that you pretty much can't mix anything else in with that unless you kind of go to a different phase of your king snake. With king snakes, I'd say there's maybe, I think there's like a couple dozen genes in king snakes, so it's pretty varied, but not compared to ball pythons with like a couple hundred genes, which is kind of crazy. Hey, it looks like we got another super chat. Let me, uh, let's see, let's see. Let me mark my spot here. Go way down to the super chat. <laughs> All right, thank you, James. Awesome video. Learned a lot from watching your channel. Always an answer for what I need to know. Thank you. Yeah, I am like, whoa, I'm like, I think I'm like, <laughs> I think I'm like about 30 questions, 30 comments behind here. I'm still way, way back here. All right, but we're going to keep going. Let's see if I can answer everybody's questions. It seems like the further we go, if we get further down in the chat, it seems like I slowly run out of questions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here, got a question here. Totally skipped my question. <laughs> so I might have skipped one already. All right, let's see. 
Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, let's see. What's the best morph to breed with a female blue-eyed Lucy? That's a good question. So keep in mind, there's like 40 different ways you can make a white snake. And with the blue-eyed leucistics, I think there's like uh, probably about 25 different ways to make a blue-eyed leucistic. If you look at all the genes and all the combinations. So it really depends on what the genes are in your blue-eyed leucistic. So, for example, you can actually take Bobby here around my neck, who is a bamboo. It's in the blue eyed leucistic. And if you had two copies of the bamboo, you'll get an all white snake with blue eyes. And if you breed that to something else, everything will come out is bamboos or bamboo combinations. So, if you have uh, a blue eyed leucistic, you really need to know what the genes are in order to figure out what to breed it with. What I'd probably do. The first thing I would probably do is take that and breed it to just any random snake, preferably something with just like one or two genes. So you can kind of tease out the individual genes in your blue eyed leucistic and then figure out what the genes are in that one. And then once you know the genes, you can actually figure out a lot of times with the blue-eyed leucistics too, you can have genes hidden in the white snake. So sometimes you'll have multiple genes on top of like a super bamboo, which is kind of crazy. I don't know what Bobby's doing here. We're going to 26 minutes in and he's already getting a little squirrely here. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, sell me your female fire pied. Yeah, my fire pied is actually a male. <laughs> it is not a female, uh, which is, uh, I, I've read that thing quite a bit. My fire pied makes some pretty awesome combinations. Uh, what's the difference between lesser and butter? I actually did a video on lesser versus butter. And a lot of people consider the lessers and butters to be exactly the same, but I think the butters can be brighter with certain example of the butters. Some of the lessers are a lot darker than the darkest butters, but I've actually seen a lot of overlap where the butters and the lessers look pretty much exactly the same, depending on what version of the butter and the lesser that you, that you actually have. Uh, how was the voice this week? <laughs> My voice is doing pretty good. I don't know if I'll go. I was thinking maybe anywhere from maybe an hour and a half to three hours. And then after this, I'll actually have to record my video for tomorrow, which is, it's actually my video tomorrow is going to be snake hacks for the snake room to make your life easier. Some of the kind of the shortcuts and some of the stuff I do here in my snake room. I'm going to record that after this as, as long as my voice holds out. Seems like my voice isn't the same since I did those 12 hour live streams. Ah, all right, Bobby. Bobby's getting a little squirrely here. All right, James, love your videos. Thank you. Kane, what is the hottest bulb Python eggs can handle during incubation? Good question. I've never really pushed the hot side of bulb Python eggs. I have seen, though, some people, as a matter of fact, I've seen some power outage where people say their eggs get down like in the 40s, like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, mid 40s, and they still hatch after they warm them up kind of like a really weird like a power outage or something else where they get really cold but I was, you know as far as the hot side i would say if you actually look at so so if you're actually breeding ball pythons i know you can artificially force the a sterilization of a male if you go above 95 degrees so i would think anything 95 degrees or hotter might damage your eggs all right, in your opinion, better combo, lemon blast clown or bamboo clown or lemon blast clown times banana clown. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, lemon, well, lemon blast, uh, let's see. So they're all clowns, you would get all clowns at least. And if you did a lemon blast with a bamboo and the clown, that would be, I don't know if anyone's actually produced one of those because the lemon blast bamboos are kind of like a silvery metallic snake. And then you put clown on top of that. That I would be really interested to see what that would actually look like. Or you could actually do a lemon blast clown times the banana clown, which would be pretty cool with the banana. The other thing with the banana is when you add the pinstripe into the banana, it actually starts out really impressive. But as it ages and matures, it kind of fades out into almost like a solid color. It really kind of reduces the contrast. So I would definitely go for the bamboo clown 
with the Lemon Blast Clown in that combination. All right, let's see. I've had my adult albino for about three weeks. Breed I had him in Iraq. I have him in a tank, two hides, lots of clutter. Still won't eat. Yeah, so uh, 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 so for three weeks, yeah, three weeks for ball python is not really a big deal as far as not eating. So uh, you can try him in Iraq. Uh, I would say if you have a couple hides and a lot of clutter, you might be okay in a tank like that, keeping them in there. Uh, let's see, what kind of cool things can I do with my pastel het pied? So I would definitely breed that to either a het pied or a visual pied to get some pastel pieds out of that. Or you can breed it with like another, another pastel and shoot for the super pastels, which I really like a lot of the super pastel stuff. Uh, I'll do a video on the adder gene. I have not done the adder gene. All right, is there anything special with breeding ball pythons like changing the temperature or waiting until you feel the follicles? I'm trying to breed my ball pythons. So yeah, so, so as far as here in my collection, I really don't change any temperatures as far as the hot spots or the room temperature. And a lot of times I don't even look at the follicles. I'll just, <laughs> I'll, just I'll just wait until October the 15th and then I'll just pair up my males and my females with the females that are of appropriate size and that are doing really well, eating pretty good. And then I'll just cycle my males through my females for about five months and then just pretty much stop the pairing and hope for the best. That's kind of the way I do it. I know there's better ways to actually do it. A lot, a lot of people, you can actually, with an ultrasound, you can look at the follicles and you can palpate and all that and breed year round. There's a lot of things you can do to increase your success. What kind is that on your neck? Yes, this is a bamboo ball python. It almost looks like a, someone's actually saying, hey, that kind of looks like a, like a gaboon viper or something. <laughs> it's definitely not a venomous snake. This snake will not hurt me if it bites me. This is Bobby, my eight-year-old bamboo ball python. Any advice for a very young teen who is getting into reptile breeding? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I'd say, you know, just buy a couple of snakes. That's usually how it starts. And then, you know, just uh, keep in mind, especially with ball pythons, it's kind of a long game as far as breeding any kind of a ball python. It's usually about three years until your females mature. And then, so if you're actually holding stuff back, usually it's three years before you can take that and then breed it back to other stuff. So it's kind of a waiting game, I'd say, for a lot of your smaller snakes. What I would probably do is I would get at least one or two mature females when you're just starting out in ball pythons and that way you have a higher success of getting eggs right from the start and you can use some of the money from the hatchlings to kind of kick start everything else and you can kind of get more excited about the eggs and the hatchlings and everything else versus waiting three years for your first eggs starting out with only hatchlings uh how much does an albino male hatchling cost that is a good question i haven't looked at albino male hatchlings for a long time I know for the longest time, just the straight albinos were selling for about two fifty, dollars pretty much. Well, that was like five years ago and four years ago, maybe three years ago when I was looking at albinos. But I haven't sold an albino for a while. My females have been kind of picky on the food. I've been kind of, kind of slowing down on the albino stuff that I've been producing. Hopefully they'll lay some eggs this year. Uh, what stage of breeding are you at right now? Yeah, so here in my reptile room, I just finished cycling my males through all my females. As a matter of fact, I actually went through all my, I'm actually looking for eggs now. I haven't found any eggs yet this year. And I, I saw maybe, I'm, I'm actually breeding 23 females. And out of all those, it looks like I have about 10 of them that look like they're going into an ovulation. So it looks like I'll have a pretty good year. I'd say anywhere from usually about 50% to about 80% of your females will lay eggs every single year. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Screaming Eagles, thank you for your service. Yes. <laughs> I was in the military for uh, the 101st Airborne for four years. I actually went to Korea for a year and patrolled the DMZ for most of that time. 
which was an interesting experience. And I remember I, this is kind of like a sidetrack. I remember, I remember when I was uh, serving in the military over in Korea, they actually had these bees that looked like uh, they're almost as big as uh, if you actually kind of wrap your head around the size of a CO2 cartridge that you use for like a BB gun or something like that. We actually had like bees that were like as big as a CO2 cartridge and you can hear them from a long ways away and they would like fly through the air like they couldn't even hold themselves up. And they said if you got stung by one of those bees, it could potentially kill you. Yeah, it was kind of crazy over there <clears throat> back in the 80s too. So yeah. How's Lucy? Lucy is doing great. She is my almost 100 pound <laughs> articulated by that. As a matter of fact, I'm actually thawing out one of my biggest rats for now. She's just pounding the rats. Kind of crazy. Uh, let's see. How much would it how much would it cost to build a rack for leopard geckos? So I'm not really a gecko guy. I wouldn't really know too much about the geckos. Uh let's see. Uh Wow, I'm pretty far behind. Let's see. Mike T, I was in from 84 to 88. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. That's when I was in. I actually joined in 84 and got out in 88. I was stationed in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky for most of the time. Went to Korea for a year. Did my basic training in Georgia, where there are a lot of snakes in Georgia. We had these big black wild snakes down in Georgia. A lot of crazy stuff down there. All right, banana male to banana female. What would the male? What would the males be? Female or male makers? Yeah. So, um, so that's it's, it gets a little bit confusing with the male makers, the female makers, and the bananas. So keep in mind if you actually have. If you take a male, uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around this too. <laughs> so if you actually take a male banana, breed it to a female banana, I don't think it really matters if the male is a male maker or a female maker, because keep in mind, everything's coming from the eggs of the female and the eggs of the female pretty much produce. Uh, so, so for example, the female lays eggs, all the banana offspring from the female would be 50% males, 50% females, because the females can't be male makers or female makers. And then all the males that you produce would be coming from the female, the eggs of the females. So all the males would be female makers. As far as I understand, I haven't actually done that pairing before, breeding a male to a female. And then you'd also get supers and the supers kind of blow my mind if you actually take a super and you read it to something else. If you have a super male, I don't think the super male would be a male maker or a female maker because it would produce all bananas. And I think you get 50-50 males and females, but I'm not 100% sure on the supers and breeding two of them together. I don't know. That's kind of where everything falls apart. I've never actually done that here in my collection because I only have males and male makers as far as my bananas and coralos. Tavian's World of Reptiles, what is up? Hunter Chavez, love your stuff, thank you. AJ Genetics, Chris is the first person I watched on YouTube, what? <laughs> that is pretty unbelievable. All right, thank you for watching. <laughs> All right, yeah, for snakes, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of snake stuff over on YouTube. And I pretty much, yeah, I have a lot of videos on YouTube. You pretty much search ball python and I have like almost 1,200 videos now, which is kind of crazy. All right, Chris Godfrey. Got my first breeder female a few weeks. She's 2,500 grams. Don't have a sonogram to see her follicles. Is there another way to tell if she's ready? So um, that's a good question. So female at 2,500 grams, I would say you, you definitely can... It, you can pair up that snake at 2,500 grams. Uh, yeah, so so essentially what I do is I don't, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll take like an ultrasound, look at the follicles, and if the follicles of the female are 10 millimeters, they'll go ahead and pair up the males and the females. And what I do is I wait until October 15th. I don't look at the follicles. I don't really care if my females are ready or not. And I'll start pairing up my males and my females on October the 15th. And some people say that the, to, to stimulate the follicle growth, 
there's either two things you can do. You can either feed them a lot more. So when you increase the amount of food, usually that stimulates the follicle growth in your ball pythons. Or a lot of people will say just the act of pairing the males and the females will stimulate the follicle growth. So that's kind of what I go by as far as, you know, just kind of conditioning my females is I just throw the male in there October the 15th and then just keep cycling my males through the females. I'm new. What is going on? Gazelle, did I say that right? Gazelle. <clears throat> what can I breed my Super Mojave with? to get awesome morphs. Yeah, so Super Mojave is an all white snake with kind of a gray head. It's a, it's a blue red leucistic. There's quite a few things you can actually breed that to like a super lesser to get some more blue red leucistics, which would be the lesser Mojave is pretty much the ideal blue red leucistic. Or you can breed it to something like a GHI combination to get the Mojave GHIs. Or you could go with something like a phantom or mystic or something like that to get the mystic potions and the purple passions like the purple colored snake so that'd be pretty cool uh let's see uh let's see if you had any what would you sell a female bamboo for ah <laughs> i'm trying to get a feel on the prices before i start um i'm not sure exactly on the prices this year I should have some more for sale here about midsummer. It's still about anywhere from two to three months away before I'll have some bamboo hatchlings. But a lot of people have asked me about some of those. Uh, do you have any snakes for sale? I don't have any snakes right now for sale. Uh, no female fire pie, nope. Uh, what's the best website? Uh, I would say probably the best website to get a snake is Morph Market. You can also go to kingsnake.com or you could do like a Craigslist. Some people go over to like a Facebook, uh, like a Facebook marketplace or something like that over. I don't really do Facebook, but a lot of people say they get snakes over there. A lot of people only sell on Facebook, which is kind of interesting. Look at the breeders page over there. Uh, let's see. I have a spinner calico. What would you recommend breeding with? So the spinner is the combination of the pinstripe and the spider with the calico. That's a pretty amazing combination. So what I would actually breed with that is a bamboo because you would actually get calico bamboos, which I really love. You would also get pinstripe bamboos, which kind of look metallic. And you would get spider bamboos, which really reduces the pattern in that, in that combination, which would be pretty awesome. Oh, wow, you're really behind on the questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really far. No, I'm not, I'm not that far behind on the questions. <laughs> I think I kept skipping ahead yesterday. All right, we're trying to catch up here. Going a little bit faster. <laughs> All right, let's see. Banana male to banana female. What would you get, male or female maker males? Yeah, so you would actually get, I think this, you would actually get female maker males because your males would actually come from the eggs of a female. I don't think it really matters if the male is a male maker or a female maker if you breed it to another banana or another coral glow. Banana and coral glow is pretty much the same thing. As far as I know, I'm not 100% sure on that one, but I think as far as my understanding, that is how it works when you breed two of them together. Uh, do you think an insulated shed would be a decent snake room, rat room with gas generator backup? So I think it really depends on where you live. So up here in the mountains of Colorado, if I actually, there's a couple problems with an insulated shed uh, for like a snake room or a rat room. What I would probably do is build a completely different building that's insulated like a building. Because number one, so for example, if I actually had the, the reptile room here in my house, like in my basement, especially in the center of my house, when I heat the room, I actually have to heat it to about 80 degrees. You'll actually find that the kind of the whole house can buffer the temperature where you're not pumping a lot of heat into it. So if I actually had a shed outside and say it's like 40 degrees below zero and I'm trying to heat the room to 80 degrees, let me tell you, it'd probably be impossible. Or if you did it, it'd take a lot of heat to heat that room. Another thing here is if I had a shed outside with rats in it up here in the mountains, all I can almost guarantee you a bear would tear that shed apart and get at my either my reptiles or my rodents in a shed outside. So it really depends on where you're at. 
if you're like in a tropical environment or something, or like a warmer climate where you didn't have bears tearing into everything, you could probably be okay with that. Uh, let's see, my mocha spider is 1,650 grams, looking to see if she's mature enough to breed. I paired her with my 800 gram Tofino. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so 1,650 grams, you can pair a female. It's close to the minimum for a female, but you should be okay. And what I do, I don't even look for the locks. Usually when I look in there, yeah, the tails are kind of lined up together, but they're not actually locking. Some ball pythons, they lock for maybe like half an hour, 45 minutes, and they won't lock again. And typically, I'll leave the males and females for about three days, anywhere, I'd say maybe a maximum of maybe a week or a week and a half if you have to say for example if you like go on vacation or something and you have to leave them together you could probably leave them for like a week or a week and a half but other than that i would probably separate them after that all right let's see let's see i lost my place uh-oh <laughs> all right here we go let's see do you eventually see hybrids being a direction the industry might go so no, I don't think hybrids are the way the industry. So, so a lot of times if you actually take two different species and breed them together, a lot of times the hybrids will actually be sterile. When you try to breed the hybrids together, a lot of times they won't be fertile and you can't make any more hybrids. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind. Another thing is, is, is say for example, I've actually seen some people where they'll take a ball python which is like, you know, like the like the snake around my neck, which is a fully mature ball python. And they'll breed this to a Burmese python, one of the craziest hybrids I've ever seen. And the Burmese can be like 17 feet long. And the problem is, is you really don't know what the temperament of that snake is going to be and how big it's going to be and really the care of that snake. So a Burmese python really doesn't need that much humidity, but a ball python prefers a higher humidity and then it gets really confusing as far as say, for example, if I'm selling that hybrid, is it gonna be six feet long or is it gonna be 17 feet long? Sometimes it can get, get the, 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 the kind of the lines can get blurred. And the other thing is, is I've actually seen some people trying to work other genes into hybrids from ball pythons into hybrids and I don't know if you can actually do that maybe there could be like the ideal hybrid where you could kind of take the genes from ball pythons and you know, work them into another type of hybrid but I haven't really seen anything that really have, has caught on yet for something like that all right what would be the outcome if you bred a super fire to a blue-eyed leucistic yeah so this one I actually did a video on this one too breeding a white snake to a white snake and you end up with snakes that aren't white so it really depends on the genes in your blue-eyed leucistic. So for example, if you had like a super lesser and you bred it to a super fire, both of them are white snakes, you would end up with all lesser fires, which is not a white snake. I don't think you could really, I don't think there's anything you can mix together with the blue-eyed leucistic and the fire to make a white snake, unless you had other genes in the mix in those. So you definitely would not end up with white snakes. Uh, is slow feeding or growing okay for a ball python? Uh, I would say probably, uh, I would probably offer a ball python a rodent at least every other week as far as probably the minimum schedule that you would offer a rodent to a ball python. You really don't want to go any longer than that. But I have seen some ball pythons that people have fed once a month, just a really small rodent. And if you actually look at the snake, it looks like a healthy snake. It looks like a really young, healthy snake. A lot of times it really doesn't look like it's been underfed. So sometimes it can kind of trick you, underfeeding or slow growing your ball pythons. I don't know if it's bad for your snake to do that, but I probably, I, I wouldn't recommend slow growing your, your ball python. Uh, how frequently do you feed your breeder females over 2,000 grams? Uh, pretty much once a week until the beginning of the breeding season. Then what I'll do is I'll actually increase to maybe two rodents per week. Uh, sometimes even three rodents per week if they're actually coming up to the breeding season. And then once they get, you know, start developing eggs, they pretty much will fast for months and months. So I can try to kind of beef them up a little bit before they go on the really long fast. 
Uh, how's the snake that you hatched out last year that came out the size of a pencil? Yeah, <laughs> that was lucky. If you watch some of my videos, I hatched out this really tiny snake. It was an all white snake with a yellow head. That was actually, uh, I think it was a pastel yellow belly spider pied 100% head albino. And it came out, I think it was twins and one of the twins died. And it came out like the, the skinny as a pencil, really super skinny. And it started eating right away. And, uh, oh, come on, Bobby. Ugh. And I think I fed that thing. It was like, I, I think I fed that thing like seven or eight rodents. And it still wasn't the size of a, a brand new hatchling. It was so super skinny. And then someone said they wanted to buy it. And I sold that snake. I actually sold it. And as a matter of fact, in the last live stream, the guy that bought it chimed in and said that snake has been eating every single week on a regular schedule. I think he said it was like 300 grams already or something like that, which is pretty awesome. All right, which clutch pairing are you most excited about this year? <laughs> I don't know what Bobby's doing here around my neck. Uh, probably the best one that I'm really excited about. I'm actually breeding my uh, my banana inchy clown to my, I actually have a, a, a lemon blast bamboo. So bamboo pastel pinstripe, which is also possible head desert ghost. So if I actually hit all those genes, I would actually get uh, a banana, enchi, bamboo, pastel, pinstripe, head clown, possible head desert coast on that one. That would be incredible if I could hit all those genes on that combination. All right, Tyler Funkler. I'm way behind on the questions. What were you doing before you got into ball python breeding? Uh, good question. I was actually a chemist. I worked in the lab. I was a chemist for almost 20 years, kind of looking to change things around a little bit. I was pretty much an analytical chemist, got a degree in organic chemistry, working with my head in the hood in a laboratory for the last 20 years, looking to do something a little bit different. I got into ball pythons just as kind of a side hobby, and then I kind of made the transition as a matter of fact, it's been uh, almost a year and a half since I pretty much resigned from chemistry and got full time into YouTube and breeding ball pythons. So that's pretty awesome. It's pretty much all I do anymore is YouTube and then breed snakes. Uh, my favorite band, my favorite movie. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, my favorite movie. Oh, I don't know if I could. I don't really watch that many movies. Um, there was an old movie, uh, it's called Twister. It's kind of an old one where they chase tornadoes, which is, which is kind of a cool one. That and like Jurassic Park are some of my favorite movies. Some of the sci-fi stuff is pretty cool. Uh, favorite bands. I like kind of the, the hardcore bands like, uh, like Metallica and, uh, Marilyn Manson, some of the more hardcore Hardcore stuff like that. Maybe some old ACDC, uh, some back in black, some, some classic rock. Uh, how do I go about getting you to mentor me? Uh, <laughs> easy way. All you have to do is watch all my videos. I pretty much everything that I can think of as far as new information I put out in all my videos. If I can think of anything new, I make a new video about it. And now after about 1200 videos, you watch all my videos and you'll probably know more about ball pythons than I do. I probably forgot half the stuff that I put out in my videos. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, you know, like I'll figure out a topic on ball pythons, like some genetics or something, and I'll study all day long about that topic and kind of, you know, absorb all the information and then I'll do a video on it. And then six months later, I'll forget half of it. It's almost like cramming for a test in school where I'll put a whole bunch of information together. And a lot of times I'm actually going back to my old videos to try to figure out some of the stuff that I, I researched and then I forgot, which is kind of crazy. So it's almost like a reference book, I guess. But yeah, probably the best way is just to look through all my videos. All right, Sam B, I'm looking for a second ball python for a pet, but also to possibly breed to my adult male. Is it worth it in your opinion to buy an adult snake? How much more expensive than a hatchling? Yeah, so uh, breed to my adult male. Is Yeah, definitely. So if you can find an adult female, that is the ideal way to jump into ball pythons. 
As a matter of fact, that's kind of the way I started. I started with some hatchlings, and after two years with no <laughs> with no hatchlings, I was waiting for all my hatchlings to mature. Someone actually sold me a whole collection of females, and I started out, I think they sold me like eight or nine females that were ready to breed. And then I bought Bobby here around my neck, bred him through those females, and produced a whole bunch of bamboos. And let me tell you, that can really kickstart your operation right from the start. So definitely, I would recommend buying at least one or two adult females. Sometimes they can be pretty pricey. Even like a normal female is a really good way to go. All right, is there any way to get a more where the eyes are blue and the snake isn't all white? Yes, there actually is a way that you can do it. So I've actually seen... Every now and then you'll actually see something with one gene from the blue-eyed leucista complex that will make blue eyes, even though it's not an all-white snake. I've seen some combinations with the lesser gene. It seems like a lot of times you mix lesser in with other combinations and it will turn the eyes blue. And I can't off the top of my head think of some of those combinations where I've actually seen uh, combinations. So one of them is if you actually take lesser and work it in with pied, You'll get an all white snake, but it's not a blue eyed cyst because it only contains one copy of lesser and it has bright blue eyes on that one. But I've actually seen where you can have like a colored snake with blue eyes too, with one copy of a blue eyed cyst. Uh, do you have a license to sell ball pythons? No, technically you don't need to, I don't know what Bobby's doing on my head. You don't need a license to sell ball pythons. But if you're making money, of course, you should probably set it up as a business. And then if you're making a profit, pay taxes and set it up as a business. I've seen a lot of people just kind of do it as a hobby on the side where a lot of people say, no, 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 it's not a business. You know, I don't really want to make that much money because I don't want to pay taxes and they'll do something like that. But technically, if you make any money, you should set it up as a business. All right, Bobby, what are you doing on my head? Uh, do you know snake breeds that are all white? So yes, there's like, there's like, uh, I'd say there's like 40 different ball python combinations that you can make to produce an all white snake. And I actually did a video on that. As a matter of fact, I think it was, uh, was I think when I did that video, it was, it was named something like 39 ways to make a white ball python. And then after I did that video, people were chiming in and giving me more ideas on how to make a white ball python. Like some of the stuff I didn't think about, like a super cinnamon albino is a completely white snake, which I didn't have on my original list. And I think we got up to, I think it was like 43 or 44 different combinations to make an all white snake. All right, let's see. All right, all right, all right. Almost lost my place here. What's your opinion on the special gene? Yeah, I picked up a male hypo special. I'm trying to figure out what to pair it to away from the DEL. So yeah, the special can be uh, the special can be a little bit tricky if you don't make a blue-eyed leucistic with it. As a matter of fact, I think I've seen some videos recently. I don't know what Bobby's doing here. What are you doing? Come on. Uh, so I think uh, I think it was Justin Kobelka that was taking special and working it into clown. And he said it was like the greatest, the newest, greatest thing, working special into clown, where it had a really dramatic effect working it into the clown gene. So I'd kind of look into that as far as pretty much the best thing that you can do with the special. How often do you feed your pythons? I like to feed them. I like to at least offer them pretty much every week or every week and a half. With my hatchlings, sometimes I'll feed my hatchlings maybe twice, sometimes three times a week, depending on what my hatchlings look like. If they're looking really super skinny and they have a really good appetite, sometimes I'll actually feed my hatchlings three times a week to kind of get them up to size. And if they're looking really plump and pudgy, I'll pretty much cut back to once a week. But a lot of times, you know, it's, it really depends on the snake. I pretty much offer every single week, but a lot of them, they won't eat every single week. All right, let's see. We got some, uh, some, uh, we got some text in a different, uh, let's see. I'm going to do convert to English. <laughs> 
All right, convert to English. And we got some, it looks like uh, maybe Arabic. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, let's see, uh, detect language, Persian, uh, convert to, convert to English, Python, uh, ball pythons, yeah, <laughs> all right, Python wings, ball pythons, uh, <laughs> all right, that was like some squiggly text here, it converts to, I don't know if this is right, it says, uh, Python wings, ball, Python balls. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a, if, that, if that's an accurate translation of that text here in the comment section. All right, you're one of my best snake video burrito. Thank you. Uh, the best way to start selling snakes. So it really depends on how many snakes you have. So if you just have a few snakes, you can bring them to like a local reptile store and sometimes a lot of times the reptile store will give you store credit, like 100% of the price in store credit. Of course, everything they buy is about 50%. And usually if you sell them to the, like the pet stores, like the reptile stores, if you ask for cash, they'll probably give you like 50%. Or if you have more than just a couple ball pythons, you can actually um, bring them to like a reptile show and rent a table. That's probably where I would start. Uh, let's see. What is your favorite snake? Yes, Bobby here around my neck. Bobby, my bamboo ball python. He is my favorite snake. If I can only choose one and I had to get rid of all the other ones, I would probably keep Bobby and get rid of the other ones. Of course, I might grab a couple of these triple head albino pied clams down here as far as some of the next ones. Maybe my pastel spider desert ghost as far as my favorite ones here in my collection. Have you ever played on a softball team? Uh, we did some softball in the military. I did hardball in school when I was a kid a long time ago. I remember once I got hit with a softball right in the temple and it knocked me unconscious. <laughs> That's like my vivid memory of softball getting hit in the head. Uh, let's see. How long do you need your snakes paired up and how many times do you pair them? So... I'll actually pair my males and females for about three days, I'd say three to five days, uh, usually about three days, and I'll cycle them through about once a month per female. So I'll take one male, put it with a female for three days, move it to another female for three days, and then I'll separate them for like a week and a half, and then I'll move on to two more females and then separate for another week and a half to kind of feed them and give them a break, cycling my males through. And I'll pair them for... Usually I pair them up, cycle my males through for about five months. So that's how I do it. I know there's a lot of different ways to run your males through your females. If you don't do enough pairing, you'll actually get uh, a lot of slugs. If you, have, if you have a lot of clutches with like multiple infertile eggs, you're not pairing your males and females enough times through the breeding season. Uh, how old do a ball python have to be to breed? I'd say for your males, some people say for the males only one year, but I would definitely go at least two years on your males. The females, some people say at least two years, but I would do at least three years on the females. Well, so, so keep in mind, a lot of times when you pair up your snakes, a lot of times they'll go on a really long fast and a lot of times it'll kind of stunt their growth a little bit versus if you don't breed them for the first few years, a lot of times you can actually grow that snake a lot bigger because it won't go on the breeding fast before. <coughs> before. <laughs> All right, my, my voice is starting to go out. <laughs> All right, here we go, here we go. <laughs> I still have my voice. All right, yeah. Woo. Yeah, so, all right, let's see. Thanks for responding. Da, 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 da. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 90 people watching. Give a thumbs up. I don't really ask for thumbs up. I don't know if it makes a difference. We got 43 thumbs up. Yeah, I usually don't ask for people to subscribe either, so... I figure, hey, I'm going to be here every single day. If you want to give me a subscribe, it doesn't matter if it's today or in a couple of years. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. All right, let's see. So how long should I wait to hold my ball python after feeding it? 
Uh, and is it different if there's no bulge when they eat? So yeah, so if you feed a really big rodent and you see a bulge in your ball python, I definitely would wait until that bulge is completely gone. I'd say usually with my ball pythons, I wait at least two to three days before you handle them after they eat. And with a really big bulge that you can actually see, I would wait maybe even up to a week for like a really big rodent on a really big snake. So it really depends. Have you ever held any venomous snakes? No, I don't really have a desire to hold a venomous snake. No, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was in the military, I almost got bit by, I think it was a cotton mouth. It was in the middle of the night and I was doing some kind of a military, uh, we were like, as a matter of fact, we were actually lost in kind of, we're in a place we weren't supposed to be. And I was in the middle of the night and I was walking around in pitch black with no flashlight. And down at my feet, I hear this, tss, tss, tss. and I took my flashlight out and shined down at the, at the ground. And sure enough, there was this snake coiled up. I'm pretty sure it was venomous. That is the closest I ever got to a venomous snake. Yeah, I definitely don't want a venomous snake. All right, recently bought a pastel trick clown. How do I tell the trick in it? Yeah, so trick can be a little tricky. So... Usually what the trick does is it really kind of jumbles up the patterns instead of giving it kind of like this clean pattern, it'll actually give you a lot of pixelation and kind of really jumble up the pattern. That's what the trick does. One of my favorite combinations is the combination of trick and pinstripe makes for a really interesting combination. I can't remember the common name for the trick pinstripe, but it does have a common name. Uh, it's like on the tip of my tongue, the, the pinstripe trick. It's a really amazing combination. Uh, my hypo special is also 50% head desert ghost. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, that'd be cool to work desert ghost into a ghost and special. Let's see, what would you breed with banana ghost male? Uh, banana ghost. Yeah, so what I really like with the ghost is working ghost into dark jeans. So if you took like a black head or even like a super black head ghost, it turns into like a steel gray snake, which is pretty awesome. And with the banana, one of my favorite combinations with banana is working banana into a lot of your pattern enhancing jeans. So you can actually take like Enchi or Leopard or Spot Nose and work it in with banana to make some cool combinations. Uh, can we talk about supers that don't exist? I'm talking about pinstripes or calicos. <laughs> yeah, the super calico. So it's kind of interesting. As far as I know, no one has ever made a super calico that I'm aware of. Although I have been thinking about breeding some of my calico males to my calico females to see if I can actually produce a super calico. For whatever reason, you can't produce a super calico and nobody really knows why nobody has ever really talked about it that I know of which is kind of interesting and when it comes to the pinstripe the super pinstripe you can actually go over to the morph market and you can see some super pinstripes and they look pretty much exactly like one copy of the pinstripe and kind of the interesting thing is you'll talk to some of these big time breeders that have been breeding for like 30 years and they're like, there's like no way a, a super pinstripe does not exist. And then you'll talk to other people and they'll say, yes, it actually does exist. But I have yet to see anyone who would take like a, like a calico or a pinstripe and claim it's a super and then breed it to something else and produce a whole clutch of pinstripes or calicos which would be pretty amazing if you could prove it out and produce uh, the super pinstripe or the super calico. So I don't know, some, it's some, some weird things with ball pythons. Sometimes you just can't produce some combinations. Uh, Ash and M Animal Adventures. What thermostats do you recommend for a rack system? So I would say, uh, what I actually use, uh, if you can afford it, I would go with the, the thermostats that actually have multiple probes 
and control multiple levels. So on my females, all my breeder females, I actually have, uh, I think it's like a Herbstat 4 that controls four different levels. And on every single level on my females, I set them all to 90 degrees so you don't have any variation in your females. I like to keep my females really steady. And then for my hatchlings and my grow outs, I don't really care if it's exact as far as the temperatures. Now what I'll actually do is I'll use pretty much any thermostat, put the probe right in the middle of the rack and you get a little bit of variation as far as the temperature from the top to the bottom. But uh, I don't think it really matters with the hatchlings in your grow outs. But my, for my females, I really maintain them really specifically. All right, let's see. What do you do if soaking the snake isn't enough to get the bad shed off? Yes, yeah, so that is a good question. So what I'll actually do is I don't really soak my snakes that much. I'll actually take them up to the sink and kind of splash water on them and then just kind of rub and peel a little bit and try to get the, the shed off that way. I've actually seen some people where they'll take uh, like a, like a, like a pillowcase and get a pillowcase wet and then kind of tie the snake in the pillowcase and the snake's kind of rolling around in the pillowcase. I've actually seen some people do that where they can actually rub against the pillowcase to get it off. What I'd recommend is actually trying to increase the humidity of your reptile room if you can to try to get that humidity up so you don't have bed sheds. Yeah, super normals, uh, super normals don't really exist because <laughs> keep in mind the normal is pretty much the absence of all genes. You strip away all the genes and you're left with a blank slate, which is called the normal or the classic or the wild type. So you really can't have a super normal. Of course, if you bred a normal to a normal, you get all normals, but technically it's not considered a super normal. All right, I'm new to snakes, but have a lemon blast, pinstripe, ball python. Will he get brighter the older he gets, or will he stay the same? So let's see, lemon blast. So the lemon blast, pinstripe. So the, the lemon blast is the pastel and the pinstripe. And I'd say um, typically your lemon blasts brown out a little bit as they get older, unfortunately. I've had some lemon blasts when they hatch, they're really super bright. And the older they get, they brown out a little bit as far as that. But it really depends on the version of pastel that you have in your lemon blast. You can actually add fire to the lemon blast. A lot of times the combination of the fire and the pastel will really hold the brightness on a lot of those combinations. Ah, please make a video on which genes hold their colors best as they age. The number one most popular question on my channel. <laughs> I have no clue which combinations hold their color better as they age. I know maybe a handful of them. As I did a, a video on that where I showed, I think maybe like four or five different combinations that really hold their color as they age, but it's, it's kind of hard. There's so many different combinations and I haven't seen a lot of snakes as far as my personal experience from hatchling all the way to adult where I can really compare the difference. How do I feel about the spider? The spider is one of the most bittersweet genes in all of ball pythons, except probably the desert gene, I'd say. The desert is painful. If you actually look at the desert where the, the females have a problem, you breed desert into anything and you make some of the most amazing combinations but the problems with the females pretty much tank the whole desert project. And the spider is kind of similar. We can actually get some head wobbles in the spiders, but the spiders, I'd say most of the times with the spiders, you can get uh, ball pythons that have virtually zero wobble in the combination. You don't really have any neurological issues, which is one of the things I think that really keeps the spiders hanging on. Then a few exceptions, you can get some really bad wobbles in the spiders. Uh, Desert Ghost holds the color well, yeah, so uh, probably the best one that I've seen is the Pastel Desert Ghost combination that really holds the color really well. The Fireflies will hold colors really well too as they age and mature. Uh, back to the permits, setting up as a business selling snakes, do you need a pet shop license or just register it as a business? So yeah, so you don't really need any licenses, well, at least here in Colorado to breed ball pythons. I actually set it up as a sole proprietor. A lot of people do 
like an LLC to kind of deflect the uh, the uh, the liability away from their personal possessions. I have yet to see anyone set up a ball python breeding business as a corporation and go public. I thought that would be kind of interesting to actually go public with your ball pythons and get into like stocks and all that. That would be kind of crazy. Looks like we got a super chat. All right, DC, thank you. Do you know anything about boas? If so, what's your opinion on feeding a one-year-old true red-tailed boa every seven days? So I really don't know anything about boas. I did one video on boa constrictors and it pretty much took me all day of research. And it was basically, I was researching all the different types and all the different localities of boa constrictors. So the only thing I know about boas is that they're live bears instead of egg layers, and they get pretty big boa constrictors. And it really depends on the locality. Some of them get a lot bigger than the other ones. But as far as the care and maintenance of a boa, and I do know that boas are harder to breed than ball pythons, that a lot of times it'll take many years to get a boa constrictor to breed, where most of the times a ball python will breed every year or at least every other year. Sometimes boas can be a little bit stubborn. But as far as feeding, I know they really don't like to eat as much as other snakes. A lot of people say that boas have a pretty slow metabolism when you're feeding boas. All right, let's see. Uh, what happened to the big colubrid you had? Yeah, <laughs> I just saw that question. So yeah, I actually had um, Big Red. Yeah, the Big Red, the corn snake. I sold Big Red. Pretty much sold everything except all ball pythons. Uh, got another super chat. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, what point is the right time to abandon the day job? <laughs> yeah, so when I quit my day job and started breeding ball pythons full time, it's kind of like jumping off the cliff because you don't really have the regular paycheck coming in regularly on a regular basis. And I pretty much did it to do YouTube. So most of my money comes from YouTube with a little bit from my ball pythons. And the hard part is the ball pythons can be pretty unpredictable. It's not like every snake is going to breed every single time, every single year. All right, Bobby. <laughs> Bobby's getting a little squirrely here. All right. But yeah, it can be it can be kind of scary jumping off from a day job. What I would probably do is I'd go to like part time in your day job. What I so so for me, the kind of the hard part is is I was doing YouTube videos every single day. And I wanted to do YouTube videos on a daily basis, which is almost impossible to do with a day job. It's extremely difficult. And breeding ball pythons at the same time. So I kind of just jumped off the cliff and started doing YouTube and ball pythons. And I'd say um, I'm not even I'm not even making what I made at my day job at this point. <laughs> it's maybe about half, which is kind of crazy. I'm still slowly getting there to, to where I left my day job. Yeah, some, sometimes I think, you know, it'd be easier just to go back to the day job and then have the weekends off and then you wouldn't have to you know, I don't know, it's, there's pros and cons to each, the day job versus kind of being on your own, doing your own business, which is kind of crazy. All right, I just bought a pastel special het pie, nice. Mr. Blue, JK4, I love spiders. All right, a spider lover. <laughs> yeah, spiders, it seems like either people hate spiders or they love spiders. And I've actually seen some people where they really like spiders and then they'll breed them and then they'll have a whole clutch with a lot of head wobbles or deformities and they're like all right i'm never going to breed spiders again and i've actually bred spiders here in my collection and i've never really had a really bad head wobbler as far as any kind of a neurological issue with my spider so i've been pretty lucky here in my collection will there ever be a dwarf ball python good question <laughs> i don't know if there'll be a dwarf or not, it'd be kind of interesting to really shrink down the ball python. I don't know if you could do any kind of like a hybrid, kind of the opposite way and breed a ball python with something really small, like a corn snake or something. I think that'd be kind of, kind of interesting or maybe like a small king snake. I don't know if you could do it, but it'd be pretty awesome. All right, third ball, black pastel, het for pie. Nice. Go for the pandas. Hey, DC, another super chat. 
Thank you. Also, how much in donations? Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> it fades off on my phone before I can read it. I'm going to go down here on my laptop. Whoa, we're pretty far down. Also, how much in donations to get you to handle one of your big snake on camera for us tonight? One of the retics. Ah. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to handle my retics because I kind of had an incident this week. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you saw that in one of my videos. I was actually, uh, <clears throat> I was, I was going to pair up my retics, my male and my female. So I took Sunny out, who's about 45 pounds, and tried to put it in the enclosure with Lucy, who's almost 100 pounds. And Lucy bit Sonny right on the head and to where the, the head of Sonny was all the way inside the mouth of Lucy. And they both coiled up into this big ball. And luckily, uh, Sonny didn't lose an eye. But let me tell you, that kind of freaked me out. He's kind of all beat up from that. And they're all really shook up. And I, I separated them. Not really going to handle them because we had that whole incident with one snake biting another snake right on the head, which is kind of crazy. All right, I don't know why, but my nose really itches tonight. <laughs> All right, let me go back. Uh, let's see, I got skipped in questions. Uh, ha, ha, ha. I don't think I skipped any. I'm trying to hit all the questions here. All right. If I skipped your question, you can go ahead and answer it again. I'll eventually get to it. What is your dream animal? So I think I pretty much, uh, pretty much have all my dream animals. I guess... Uh, I really just want to keep increasing uh, my my combinations here in my reptile room. So a lot of times, was like when I first started in ball pythons, I started with pretty much single gene, double gene combinations, and I'm slowly getting into like four gene combinations, which I produced last year. But I'd really like to get into like five or six or seven genes and then breed those through my collection, which would be pretty awesome. Maybe add some other genes slowly eventually to my collection <clears throat> all right uh colton butler make chris hardwick famous yes <laughs> slowly getting there i'll be I, i'll probably be famous in maybe another 10 years <laughs> i might be famous maybe with a million subscribers all right what are the fees and requirements for selling in an expo so if you're selling at a reptile show really depends on the show i'd say you have to really sign up for the show at least probably a couple months in advance so you reserve a table if you get close to the last couple weeks i'd say you might not get a table at the reptile show and as far as uh <clears throat> as far as the tables you actually it's, on some of them you actually have a whole map of the reptile show and a lot of times you can pick your specific table sometimes you'll actually just sign up for a table and they put you wherever they want in the whole reptile show which is kind of a bummer i actually like picking out my table and then the price of the table really depends on the show. I've actually paid, I think some shows are less than $100, like $80 a table. And I paid all the way up to like $125 for a table, which can add up really quick. Let me tell you, if you get like four or five tables and you're throwing down like $500 just in table fees, it can be pretty expensive. You have to sell a lot of stuff just to break even at the reptile show. And some people actually lose money because they get too many tables and they don't sell enough merchandise. Opinions on the sunset. Yeah, the sunset's pretty awesome. Pretty new, Gene. Uh, still kind of feeling out the sunset to see where it's going. It looks like so far it's really visually dominant when you work other genes in with the sunset. It can completely mask some of the other genes. How old are you? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll give you a hint. I was born in 1966. <laughs> if you can figure out how old I was from the year I was born, which is a long time ago. All right, let's see. Have you noticed while working with the spider gene if the head wobble is severe as others? So I haven't had any severe head wobble. It seems like what I've noticed, it seems like when you work spider into desert ghost, it seems like I haven't really seen a spider desert ghost with a severe head wobble. So potentially uh, it could be another gene that could reduce the wobble in the spiders. Hey, we've got another super chat. All right, thank you, DC. 
Oh yeah, I do remember that video. Glad they are okay. Last question. How soon after feeding my female ball python can I pair a male with her again? So, so yeah, so I kind of had this problem the first few years when I was breeding. I would feed my males and my females when I'd separate them and then wait a day or two and then pair them up. And I found that even after two days, sometimes the female would, would regurgitate and throw up that rodent. As a matter of fact, I actually saw on one of my females, it was after three days and I paired it up again with a, with a male three days after feeding and it still regurgitated. So I'd probably wait at least four to five days after feeding, especially if it's a big rodent before you pair it up with another ball python. All right, let's see how far back we are, way back in these questions. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm like 30 questions behind here, which is kind of crazy. All right, my four month old bumblebee ball python is very active, eats very well and seems in great health, but wheezes a lot. So yeah, so it, it really depends. So for example, if I actually pick up Bobby, sometimes just picking him up, he'll wheeze a little bit because I'm like squeezing the air out of him. But if you're actually just at a, like just at a rest, if your ball python wheezes a little, you probably have a respiratory infection. You should probably see a veterinarian. What I would actually do is I'd take a small video of your ball python breathing and then send it to a veterinarian to see if you can get any advice as far as what they do. Usually I think they give them shots, like an antibiotic shot to cure a respiratory infection. Uh, 80 people watching and only 40 likes. <laughs> now we have, well, now we have 59. Pretty cool. What's up, T Slater? Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, I'm new to the ball python community. Got my first ball python, which is a pastel enchi yellow belly. Still learning the ropes. Pastel enchi yellow belly, that is pretty awesome. The pastel is bright and then you add it to the yellow belly, that's bright. And the enchi can really brighten and reduce a lot of your combination. So that's a pretty awesome combination. That's a really super bright, you could actually breed that to like an orange dream or something like that, or work that into some of the highways and the freeways. Pretty powerful breeder on that one. Hey Chris, what is the upper limit of age for a female ball python to breed? So I've actually seen, that actually had an article uh, about a zoo that had a 63 year old female that laid eggs. I don't even know if ball pythons could get to be 63 years old. So I don't really think there's an upper limit uh, as far as breeding ball pythons. And it seems like the older they get and the bigger they, they get, they actually, uh, <clears throat> they'll actually lay more eggs, which is pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, got eight new pickups yesterday and today. Nice, awesome. I've held a green tree, viper, and a copperhead. Ah, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I don't think there's any venomous snakes in my future. That kind of, yeah, I don't want to risk my life on a snake bite. What do you think is the next up and coming morph? That is a good question. I would say, I would say probably the, the, the confusion, the acid and the static, which a lot of people think are the same gene. I think those are really going to be pretty big. They, it's, it's, it's almost like the leopard on steroids. It's a dark gene and it really shatters the patterns in a lot of combinations. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Ra uh, Rachel Stamp, I didn't know you were in the military. I'm currently on duty right now, waiting for my watch to be over. <laughs> what was your MOS uh, in the military? So yeah, so my MOS in the military, I was 11 Hotel, which is an anti-tank gunner. We actually sh used to shoot the tow missiles which is like a wire guided missile. You'd shoot this big missile and it would blow up tanks, which is kind of crazy. Kind of like, I'd say almost close to a ground pounder, like an 11 Bravo. That was like a lifetime ago. I got out in 88, that's kind of crazy. I saw a guy that had a really, really bright yellow genetic stripe. Yeah, so I've actually seen some really amazing genetic stripe combinations, which is pretty amazing. 
Uh, my ball python has holes on her stomach. Do you know what that is? No, I've never seen holes <laughs> in a ball python. The only hole is just the hole right in the bottom, the vent where they go to the bathroom. They shouldn't have any holes other than that, which is kind of crazy. As a matter of fact, I actually had one ball python that had a hole kind of on the navel where I had a big plug. And uh, it was almost like this big obstruction right in the navel after it was born. I brought it to the vet and the vet pulled it out and then stitched it up. It was kind of crazy. But usually they shouldn't have holes in the belly. Michael Hewitt, longtime subscriber. Thank you. Love my content. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. So other than pinstripe and calico, I was wondering if there's any other supers that don't actually make a super, but aren't a lethal combination. So, uh, yeah, so how to make supers that aren't supers, that aren't a lethal combination. So uh, I don't think there's actually a super granite. And a lot of the a lot of the, the 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 genes that really like I don't I'm not sure if there's a super trick the kind of the trick and the hurricane and some of those genes that really scramble up the pattern I don't know if you can make a super on some of those genes. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, what point do you abandon the day job and start breeding full time? Oh uh, yeah, so I already answered that one. <laughs> I would say there's really no right time to abandon your day job and pursue your own career doing anything. <laughs> no time is the right time. Let me tell you, it's a scary adventure doing anything, getting away from the regular paycheck of a day job. It can pay off in the long run. You can make it or you can break it. It's kind of going away from your day job, which is kind of crazy. I would say don't burn your bridges. You can always go back to your day job. All right, any python, any python worth its weight in gold? Yeah, so a lot of the new stuff coming out is kind of worth its weight in gold. So, so Bobby is getting a little crazy. I'm going to switch Bobby for Bubble. We'll get Bubble on since Bobby's been on for an hour and a half now. We'll switch, switch snakes here. Give Bobby a break. He's getting squirrely. Woo. All right, Bobby. I'll pull up Bubble. I checked Bubble already. She does not have any eggs. And I don't think she's ovulated yet. Although I am breeding Bubble. I don't know. She looks like she looks like she might eat. As a matter of fact, uh, she ate the third week of March. So she still ate. Take a look at that snake. Pretty big. Big massive pinstripe. One of my friendliest snakes other than Bobby. This is Bubble. Pretty awesome. So any python worth its weight in gold. So as a matter of fact, when the bamboo first came out, I heard that some of the very first bamboo ball pythons <clears throat> were selling for over $100,000, which is kind of crazy. So I'd say like the scaleless, I think uh, the very first completely scaleless ball python uh, was uh, someone actually offered to buy it for like $150,000 or something like that, which is kind of crazy. Pretty much worth its weight in gold. Some of those jeans just coming out. Uh, let's see. Since I'm, um, would it be okay for me to get a ball python? Uh, since I'm 13. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're 13 years old, yeah, it depends on your parents. <laughs> if your parents let you get a snake, you can get a ball python. Yeah, you can definitely get one at 13. Shouldn't be a problem. They don't really get that big to where you really can't muscle a ball python at 13. I'd probably keep like an adult ball python away from toddlers, you know, like one-year-old, two-year-old kids. I probably would make sure you supervise something like that. But, you know, any, you know, like any kid, you know, eight to eight, eight years old and above, I'd say it's at least perfectly fine and you can definitely control a ball python at that age uh do you ever plan on doing private one-on-one -on -one for people needing advice on everything ball python from morphs to breeding to business um not really i haven't really set up anything where i'm doing like a one-on-one -on -one consultation 
But let me tell you, my schedule is completely full, pretty much from when I wake up all the way to when I go to bed, doing, you know, taking care of all my animals with the breeding and the selling and the shipping of the snakes and doing YouTube videos and everything. It's this, I really don't have time for anything else at this point. Unless something changes, I don't really see that in the near future. Uh, let's see what happened to the big colubrid. Yes, I sold Big Rand. He was one of my favorites, but I want to focus just on ball pythons. Uh, let's see what should I do if I receive a ball python from Morph Market, and that is temper. Temper? You mean that has a bad temper? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, sometimes the hatchlings can have, if you're talking about like a bad tempered snake, uh, sometimes the hatchlings can be really super bitey. And it really depends on the genes too, I think. As a matter of fact, I actually produced a lot of double heads, het for albino and het for pine. And it seemed like for whatever reason, every single double head that I produced was from breeding my albino pine to something else was really snappy, which was really crazy. And it really took... Quite a, quite a bit more work to get it over that snappy period. But what I would actually do is I would definitely handle that snake, maybe hold it for like 45 minutes to an hour until it completely relaxes. Sometimes they're just afraid of people and it just takes a lot of handling with those hatchlings. Uh, at what size does your collection go from hobby to part-time job? Um, yeah, it really depends. So if you have like three snakes that are like $10,000 snakes <laughs> and you're breeding those and you can make a lot of money from just those things. The problem is, is if you have a lot of money invested in just a couple of snakes, some years those snakes won't breed. I've actually had snakes that haven't bred for like four or five years. I'm still waiting on some of my females. So if you invest a lot and they won't breed year after year and you're depending on that for your income, Sometimes it can be kind of crazy. So I would probably, you know, have a larger collection with probably least, less expensive snakes where you can kind of diversify a little bit so you're not, you know, have all your money on one project. How long should you do two snakes in with each other? I usually leave uh, the male with the female for anywhere from three days to about a week and a half. And this year, I pretty much three days across the board, leaving my males with the females. I like the super asphalt. Yes, yeah, super asphalts are awesome. Expensive too, <laughs> super expensive. All right, I can't get my baby super pastel enchi yellow belly to eat. I tried the live mouse, it didn't work. Uh, so yes, so if you have a baby, a baby ball python, if it's eaten before, a lot of times uh, you just have to keep trying again and again. You can actually take like a, like a, like a live mouse, a small live mouse hopper, you could leave it in there. I've actually left them in overnight, like a like almost like a crawler mouse. That's like a like, kind of like a fuzzy mouse that's not too big. You know, the, they're pretty much harmless if you get a small enough mouse in there with a ball python. I'd probably try leaving it in there overnight. And if it doesn't eat and doesn't eat and doesn't eat, and then sometimes you have to uh, resort to assist feeding as a last resort. But uh, I probably wouldn't do assist feeding until you pretty much ran out of options and that snake gets super skinny. I usually assist feed, maybe if it hasn't eaten for like a month and a half and I start getting real desperate, then I'll move into assist feeding. Uh, let's see, does the amount of eggs in a clutch depend on the weight of the female? How many eggs do you get from your biggest female? Yes. So the number of eggs from any snake really depends on the weight of the snake. So usually if you're breeding like a 1500 gram ball python, 1500, 1600, like at the minimum size, you'll get about six eggs on average, like five to six eggs. Normally you get about six eggs. Some of my biggest females that are like 5,000 grams, something like that, I'll get it, I'll get up to maybe 13 or 14 eggs. I've actually seen up to 16 eggs on some really big females. So it can be pretty awesome. Uh, have you seen the riots in Bristol? They're setting police vans on fire and shooting them with fireworks. No, I have not seen that. I know it seems like people everywhere are just going crazy over one thing. Or the other. It seems like every time I turn on the news, people are just going crazy. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
All right, <laughs> I gotta take another drink. All right, just seen your video from a year ago of your first time breeding. How much do you estimate you earned since then? <laughs> How much money do I make on my ball pythons? Uh, it depends on the year. If you look at my total sales, I made pretty much a lot. But if you actually look at my sales minus what I put into my ball pythons, you know, over the initial few years when I was breeding ball pythons, I'd make, you know, like six or seven thousand dollars. And then I'd use, you know, a thousand dollars to buy, you know, a pallet of coconut husk to keep me through for the next few years. Or I'd buy like one of these racks. One of these racks behind me, they cost like $3,000. So let me tell you, if you make like $10,000, then by three racks, you're pretty much just breaking even at that point. And a lot of times you'll put it back into it. And then last year, I bought a banana inchy clown, which was like $1,500. So I've been making pretty much money, but most of the money that I make from my ball pythons, I put back into it as far as that. And keep in mind, if you're actually running it as a business, every time you make a profit, you have to pay taxes on the profits. So if you make $10,000 and then you put $10,000 back into your business, you don't pay any taxes. But if you make $10,000 and then you just put it in the bank, you're paying like $5,000 in taxes because the taxes for sole proprietors are extremely high. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, if you had to work with a type of reptile other than snakes, what would you pick? So I do have some crested geckos, but it's pretty low maintenance. I don't know if I'd work with any other reptiles other than snakes. Pretty much the ideal reptile when it comes to working with any kind of a reptile. Do you think the banana clowns are worth the money? Yes, uh, banana clowns are, it seems like the banana clowns have been really holding their price for a really long time. So it's pretty awesome. Don't both genes fade over time? Yes, they do fade a little bit and you'll get a little bit of fading. I actually have a banana inchy clown that's faded quite a bit since it was, a, it seems like a lot of your clown combinations start out really super impressive with a really high definition and then they kind of fade a little bit as they age and mature. Some of them can fade a lot as they age. Uh, let's see, uh, 56, 53, 56, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, yes, I am a vampire. I was born in 1966. <laughs> All right, if you don't have money for snakes, don't buy them, yeah. Hello, everyone. What's up? Bitcoin for days. I am really far behind in the comments. Let's see how far. Well, I guess we're not that far behind. Maybe about 20 comments behind. All right. So you were a scientist. So when you were challenged with the test, you say, well, it's not rocket scientists. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, one thing I was actually thinking about joking about here on YouTube I was like, you know, scientists say that ball pythons are the best snake, you know, because I'm a scientist and that's what I say. So <laughs> I haven't really gone down the, you know, the kind of the jokester side of YouTube, kind of doing the kind of the, the jokes and stuff like that. But I thought about doing some kind of puns on the whole scientist thing. Uh, you missed my question just two back. Uh, Sheila? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm going way back. I don't see your question, Sheila. I don't know if you, uh, if, if it actually went through. That's weird. Uh, just two back. Huh. Okay. So, Sheila Joe, you might have to ask your question again because for some reason your question didn't come through. It's just completely gone. <clears throat> Anthony Lou, hey, what is up? Acid morphs, yes. Colton, yes, they're pretty awesome. All right, by feeding live, doesn't it make you more vulnerable for a bite by your ball python? Uh, yeah, I would say if you're feeding ball pythons live rooms, it does seem like your ball pythons do get a little bit more snappy and a little bit more aggressive when you're feeding live. They can get a little bit ballistic. But, you know, ball pythons, you know, a lot of times if you, if you actually, especially like in a rack system, if I pull a tub out 
And the ball python is just like, you know, kind of tracking me, trying to bite me. What I'll actually do is I'll take the tub out and I'll put it on a table. And then sometimes you can actually take the tub and spin it around like 360 degrees. And the snake gets a little bit dazed and confused. A lot of times that will actually snap them out of a crazy feeding mode. Or a lot of times you can just go behind in the back of the snake and kind of mess with their tail a little bit. And they, they can you can snap them out of a feeding mode pretty quick. All right, let's see. Did you jump? Uh, I, I assume that was uh, back in the military. Yes. Um, so talking about my military days, <laughs> I was actually I was actually in the uh, civilian parachute club where we would go up in helicopters and we would jump out with civilian parachutes, the square ones, where you would do like tiptoe landings. It was pretty awesome. But as far as kind of my specialty, I'd say we were kind of like the uh, air assault unit where the, kind of the specialty of my unit in the military, we'd actually ride on helicopters, we'd fly below tree line level, like really low to the ground, and then we'd rappel out of the helicopter so it was like uh, uh, an, uh, like a repelling assault unit back in the 80s, a whole lifetime ago, which was a long time ago. Yeah, that was kind of crazy. Yes, the toe. Yes, it's just, uh, let's see, don't feed them live. Yeah, some people feed a lot of lives. Some, some countries say that uh, it's against the law to feed live in some countries. You can't feed live rodents to your snakes, which was kind of crazy. Some people were saying that in the live stream yesterday, that if they fed their ball pythons live, they can get all their ball pythons confiscated, which is crazy. I think you, you know, especially for hatchlings, I think it's essential to at least feed live mice to your hatchlings. Hey, we got another super chat. Thank you, DJ. All right. Let me go now into the super chat question. Best ARS models to start a collection. Start a collection with five juveniles, six on a gram, females, two males. Any suggestions? Uh, let's see. That is a good question. <laughs> so uh, if I was to actually completely start over, the problem is, is when you have hatchlings, you really need a hatchling rack. So for example, this rack right here is a hatchling rack. And then after I'd say maybe, you know, a few months, four or five months, you need to move them up to a grow out rack like this. And then they get to the point of the grow out rack where they get too big and they don't really fit in there, especially your females will get too big in the grow out racks. And then you have to move them to an ARS 7030 pretty much as like the full time rack for an adult ball python. So what I would actually do is if I was starting all over, what I would buy is I would buy ARS 70 series stuff. You can actually buy like a 7010, which is a single stack, or like an ARS 7020 that has kind of like the two levels side by side. Or like an ARS 7030 has three tubs per row. You can do any 70 series. And then start with like an adult female or multiple adult females and an adult male put them in those racks and then what i do is that when, when you actually produce some hatchlings from those adults you can produce them in the first year or two you can kind of crank them out if you buy adults right from the beginning and then when you sell those hatchlings you can invest in the ars 5040 tubs and the ars hatchling tubs i think you pretty much need all three types of tubs as far as kind of the long-term operation it's always kind of a struggle trying to figure out the right number of tubs for the snakes that you have all right, yeah, that was a long answer to that question. All right, so let's see. I've been building a rack for my females. I would definitely say if you value your time, it may be better to buy a professional rack. So yeah, so that's the thing with building your own rack. I've actually seen kind of some fails when it comes to uh, building your own rack. And pretty much the, the number one thing I've seen is you'll actually make a rack and it won't have enough ventilation in the tubs or a lot of times you'll get a lot of a lot of condensation in the tubs or you have too much ventilation where it dries out really quick so kind of dialing in the the ventilation is is kind of the key and like on these if you actually look right at the top right above the tub in the front it has kind of this open spot with a whole bunch of holes 
in the top. So there's a lot of ventilation on the top in the front of the tub. Where if you actually look at them kind of like this, it looks like they're completely closed, but there's a lot of ventilation. And the other thing I've actually seen, especially with older racks, if you're making them out of like a particle board or something like that, I've seen a lot of times where the boards will start warping or molding a little bit and they start warping and the tubs won't slide in and out of the tubs. And a lot of people, once they start warping, then they have to go through and replace them. And a lot of people that get the cheap racks end up upgrading to better racks too. All right, what was the longest time you've ever had a gravid female ball python take to lay? So depends what your definition of gravid is. So for example, when I'm actually pairing up in mid-October, when I first start pairing my males and females, I can actually take my ultrasound and look inside of some of the females and you'll actually see some follicles, sometimes like 10 millimeters as far as the follicle size. So technically, I guess you can consider those gravid. And at one point do the follicles, you know, what size of the follicles grow to be considered to be gravid females? So technically they could be gravid for most of the year. They, they contain follicles at a certain size pretty much most of the year. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen some where they'll have some small ones right after they lay too. So they're almost always, I guess you could say they're almost always gravid. But of course you need a male to fertilize the follicles in order to uh, develop those eggs. All right, so I saw another super chat come through. Let's go down to that one. Sink the frog, thank you. Chris, thanks for all your time you put into giving out info. It helps a lot. How do you think the pandemic has affected the last year for new breeders? <clears throat> so I think the pandemic has actually helped the ball python industry because a lot of people have been losing their jobs, looking for another place to make money. And you can actually do this pretty much at home and all online. You can do it remotely. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's one of the things that a lot of people are getting into. I think that's what's really driving up the prices of a lot of these ball pythons over the last year. So yeah, I think it's I think the pandemic has been a good thing. A good thing for the ball python industry. I don't know if it's a good thing, you know, to have a pandemic, but as far as what I'm seeing in the ball python industry, it seems like everything's kind of taken off from the pandemic. All right, let's go back to my list of questions here. I think I'm about only about 20 questions behind here. All right, Mr. White. Hey, Chris, what do you think is the next up and coming morph? I think it's the acid or the static or the confusion. I think once those take off, it's going to be really big. The price is really high right now. I think that's what's really keeping a lot of people from getting into those genes. Uh, do you ever lose interest in your snakes? No, I actually haven't. As a matter of fact, when I first got into ball pythons, I felt like, man, where have I been for the last 20 years? All of this cool stuff in ball pythons, and I've been missing it all. Uh, I was pretty much, you know, since I pretty much discovered ball pythons like six years ago, and I couldn't believe what was going on with snakes and ball pythons. And it's, it's so fascinating, and there's so many different genes and combinations I've never really lose interest in the snakes. It's a pretty amazing hobby. Pranks, hello from the Philippines. What is going on the Philippines? I was actually doing, uh, yesterday somebody asked me about my statistics. I think the Philippines is like 0.2% uh, of my viewers come from the Philippines, which is kind of interesting. Where's Bobby? Bobby's taking a break because uh, he was around my neck for about an hour and a half. We're almost at two hours now going on this live stream. Still have 78 people, 84 thumbs up. All right, thank you for all the thumbs up. I'm not sure how much the thumbs ups helps, but uh, <laughs> uh, some people say that with the, with, if you actually hit the thumbs up, it promotes my video a little more. I don't know if that's true or not, but <laughs> I usually don't ask for thumbs up on my videos. All right, let's see. Just getting into the hobby breeding, would you go pine or clown? So it's kind of interesting. I actually did a video comparing the pine and the clowns. 
And uh, I would say it really depends on which genes that you have in your collection. For example, if you actually have pastel and work the pastel into the pie, it seems like the pastel works better with clown versus the pie. And it seems like almost with every gene, depending on what gene it, work, it is, it works better with one combination versus the other. So the stuff that works really good with the, uh, with the, with the pie, like a super orange dream pie, which is a really super bright orange snake, doesn't really affect the clown as much as it does the pie. So it really depends on what genes you have in your collection as far as which one you go for. But if you didn't have any other snakes and you're just getting into it, I would probably go with the clowns. So if you actually compare the pies with the clowns, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a pretty close competition between the pies and the clowns. They're pretty much the two most popular recessive genes in all of ball pythons. All right, looks like we had another super chat. All right, thank you, Benjamin. What would you say is the best pairing of ball pythons for breeding. <laughs> the best pairing of ball pythons, you mean the best genes? Uh, yeah, there's like there's like hundreds of genes and combinations. Probably uh, if you're actually the best, uh, the best pairing as far as breeding, well, it really depends what you're going for. So I would probably do like a visual recessive bred with a visual recessive so you can get all visuals or probably the best thing to do would be to breed, you know, like multi-gene, like dominant or co-dominance together so you can get a whole rainbow of different combinations. But as far as the best gene, yeah, it really depends. You know, I think, you know, one of my favorites is the pinstripe, like bubble around my neck here. You know, I like the bamboos, of course, with Bobby. Pretty much all the genes across the board are pretty awesome. All right, so let's go way back here. Let's see, let's see. Uh, can I see the baby pastel desert ghost? Now, <laughs> I actually, my pastel desert ghost baby, I actually sold it. I sold pretty much all my hatchlings. I only held back two of them. Decided just to hold back two every year. And this last year, I just held back two males because I don't have enough males to service all my females. I actually held back a... Uh, <clears throat> So one of my males was my uh, pinstripe banana, or it's actually a pinstripe coral glow. That's possible head pie. And then I held back my bamboo pastel pinstripe calico possible head desert ghost. Those are my two males that I held back, but I pretty much sold everything else. Have I tried breeding my retics? Yes. So I actually paired them this spring and I actually saw a lock for the very first time. Lucy is like five years old. And a lot of people are saying that reticulated pythons have to be at least five years old in order to breed them for the first time. So I'm hoping she'll actually go this year. Although she's like eating a lot of food right now. So I don't know if she's gonna breed this year, maybe next year. I don't know if they're gonna go this year. All right, let's see. Super pastel, spark, yellow belly, male, vanilla, cream, male. Uh, so one or the other, super pastel, spark, yellow belly, or vanilla cream. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, that's, yeah, spark and yellow belly. So that would be from the Puma. And then you have the super pastel. So it actually looked like a super pastel or you'd have a vanilla cream. I'd probably go with the vanilla creams. <laughs> I really like the vanilla cream combinations. All right, let's see. When you first bring home a new Python, I understand you shouldn't hold it for about a week, but in that time, should I worry about feeding it or try to feed it? So, <clears throat> so a lot of people say you shouldn't hold your ball Python for the first week. I actually prefer to hold my snakes as soon as I get them. So there's kind of a kind of a difference in opinion between whether you should hold them or not. And I would probably wait, I'd, I'd probably wait at least a few days before you feed that ball python to let it settle in, make sure the temperatures come up to normal. You really don't wanna feed a cold snake, especially if you had it shipped in. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> well, my, let's see. Will my female ball python lay eggs if she's never been with another snake? Probably not. They actually call that parthenogenesis, which is extremely rare. <clears throat> 
Yeah, so so ball pythons won't so so they actually won't lay eggs like a chicken, you know. And you can actually have uh, like a chicken, and the chicken will lay eggs all the time. Ball pythons aren't really like that. Sometimes you can get eggs from a ball python without a male, but it's extremely rare to actually do that. Tegus, yeah, tegus. Uh, I thought about doing a tegu, which would be pretty interesting. It's a big, huge lizard. Like the red tegus are like really big puppy dogs. They get really super big. That would be a handful, I think, getting a tegu. I heard you can actually potty train a tegu. All right, BR. I just got a GHI fireball fence. Uh, fireball fence <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. What are your thoughts on the GHIs? Yes, so the GHI is a dark gene. GHI stands for gotta have it. I think my favorite GHI is working it into the Mojave. The Mojave GHIs are like a completely black snake with a really bright dotted yellow line right down the top. Pretty awesome. The other thing you can do with GHI is work it into ghosts. Like GHI or super GHI in a ghost will give you like a steel gray ball python which is pretty awesome. Finally, a scientist with balls. <laughs> yes, I have a lot of balls. I actually have uh, over 40 balls in my collection, maybe 100 by the time the year ends. Yeah. Uh, all right, what's up, Mr. Cluckins? Uh, make a hybrid cross a ball with the blood. So it's kind of interesting. At one point, I actually had an Australia woma ball, ball python. Uh, it was it's actually not a ball python. It's an Australia woma python. I was thinking about breeding it to a ball python to make a hybrid. Thinking about maybe working other genes into like a, I think they call it the wall, the, the, the cross between an Australian woma python and a ball python. And I decided I didn't want to go down the whole road of doing hybrids and pretty much decided against doing a hybrid combination. But I was actually thinking about it and I had the snakes here in my collection, but I never paired them up. And I've since sold my Australian woma to someone else that had some Australian womas. Uh, let's see, I got lots of snakes but have not bred them yet. What would a banana spinner and a butter clown make? Good question. Banana spinner and a butter clown. So keep in mind the clown is a recessive combination. So if you breed a clown to anything else that's not head clown or a visual clown, you'll get all normal looking snakes. You won't see one copy of the clown. So pretty much would wipe out all your clowns. And then you have the combination of the banana, the, the spider, the, uh, the, the um, let's see, the butter, the butters and the blue are the cystic. So you'd actually get a whole combinations between the pinstripe, the spider, the banana, and the butter. All of them would be head clown. So you get a combination of four genes in all those. Looks like we had a super chat sneaking in there on the bottom. Thank you, Trevor. Super chat question. What jobs are out there for someone wanting to work in the industry but not be a breeder or leader of an operation? Good question. So probably what I would do is if you're actually just starting out, I would work in a reptile store. That would be pretty awesome because then you get used to all the different uh, you know, all the different reptiles. And a lot of the reptile shops will actually breed ball pythons which is pretty awesome. So then you can get some insight and pretty much everything. And a lot of times, a lot of people come into reptile stores with a lot of questions, and then you can kind of hear all the answers for the questions from some of the experts. So probably a reptile store is where I do, or you could actually work at a zoo, like in like a snake house or something like that. Although I don't know if I'd want to work with a venomous, you might get, you have to be careful doing something like that. So all right, yeah, so as a matter of fact, I actually have a video on jobs in the reptile industry. You might want to take a look at that. There's a few things you can do. You could be like a veterinarian assistant or something like that. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, using vermiculite exoterra precision pro box incubator, vermiculite in box 70% humidity one to one. Should I increase the ratio to improve to 
Uh, 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 so it's a humidity question in the incubation box. So I'm not sure it really matters. So if you have vermiculite and something else in a humidity box, I actually seal up my, my hatching boxes with the press and seal on top of the box. And I don't really measure the humidity inside of the box. I think you're fine with the humidity in there. Just as long as your snake eggs don't dry out, you should be fine. Juan Gomez. Hi, Chris. I live in Wisconsin. I have a female ball python. She's about two and a half feet long. She hasn't eaten for over a month. Humidity 60%, temps 80, cold 90, hot. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, it looks like you're not doing anything wrong. It looks like your uh, ball python is just being stubborn. They can go on a fast for a really long time. They can fast for months and months at a time. Two months when I'm about two years old. Uh, let's see, well, two and a half feet long. Mm. Depends on how old she is. Two and a half feet long is probably, I'm trying to think about how, how old a two and a half, that'd be probably like 600 grams, 800 grams. What I would actually try on that one, I would probably go back to like a live mouse to see if you can kind of tease it and get it back on live mice. Maybe like, uh, like an adult mouse, you could try that to kind of get it back on food. That might do the trick on that one. Uh, let's see. Is it normal this time of year? Yes. Usually uh, uh, fasting this time of year is really normal. Hey, got another super chat. Thank you. Let's go to the super chat question. Trashman0131. What new project are you thinking of working on? If you don't have one, what do you wish you could start? Yeah, so I'm thinking about my next project will probably be like an acid, static, or confusion working that into some of my combinations. I'd really like to get into leopard too. That'd be pretty awesome. I really want to expand more into the desert ghosts. Uh, if I could afford it, I'd probably get into the monsoon project. It's a little bit under my price range. I think monsoons, just the het monsoons are still selling for thousands and thousands of dollars. Let's see. What's up, all gas, no brakes? What's up, OD Coffee? Oh, let's see. I uh, really can't find hatchlings on Morph Market. Yeah, it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Do completely scaleless ball pythons have any health problems? Good question. So I have heard with the scalus that they take a little bit more care than some of the other snakes, basically because you do, they, they have a problem shedding, apparently. You have to keep them a little more humid than your typical ball python, or sometimes they can have a problem with shedding. Although I don't have any scalus here in my collection, so I'm not sure exactly what the problem is with the, the scalus ball pythons as far as shedding. I've actually seen some people where they'll take like uh, like uh, uh, they'll take some kind of like a lotion or an oil or something and they'll kind of lube them up right before they shed to make sure they shed really good, which is kind of interesting. I've never really seen a lot of people do that, but it's, you know, the scaleless is pretty new. We're just kind of investigating all the ins and outs of the scaleless. So as far as I know, they really don't have any other health problems, but an occasional bad shed as far as what I've known. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, uh, how do your hot spot temperatures stay steady in your rack? That's a good question. So if you actually have, hey, thanks for the super chat. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you for the info. All right. Thank you for that. All right. So. So yeah, your, your temperatures in the rack can really vary from one part of the rack to the other, especially if you just have like one thermostat on the rack and you put the probe right in the middle of the rack. A lot of times the top of the rack and the bottom of the rack can be a lot colder than the middle. And for my females, I actually have multiple controllers. I have like Herbstat 4s, right? It will actually control four levels. And I put a controller on every single level 
for my female breeders, which is a little bit overkill. I've never seen anyone else do it. And it's pretty expensive to set it up that way, but I set it up like that years ago and it's been working great. Every single female is on a 90 degree hotspot. And for my hatchlings and my growths, I don't think it really matters as far as the variation in the, the temperatures in the ring. All right, thoughts on lesser to het pied. Heard they have potential genetic issues like spider champagne. No, uh, yes, yeah, so if you take a lesser and you breed it to a het pied, you will get 50% lessers, 50% normals, and all of them will be 50% het pieds. No problem with that pairing at all. So if you get... Um, so if you get a lesser pied, I don't know about the genetic issues like a spider champagne. I actually had a lesser pied I recently sold. And the interesting thing about the lesser pied, it's a completely white snake and it has like micro eyes and has really tiny eyes on the lesser pieds. And the lesser pieds can also have bright blue eyes with just one copy of the lesser gene, which is pretty interesting. Talia, thank you for answering. Uh, thank you for answering. Yes, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Open up a reptile store. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so opening a reptile store is another, yeah, that is, I've seen some people open reptile stores, and let me tell you, that is a 24-7 job running a reptile store. That is your life, running a reptile store. That can be really involved. Uh, how do you get your ball python to stop to start eating? He stopped in October. Yes, yeah, so I would just keep offering uh, every single week. And uh, there's a couple things you can try. So what I do is I actually heat up my rodents with my heat lamp and heat them up to the really nice and toasty warm, almost hot when you put them in your head, but not like a burning hot hot. And then a lot of times, just from the the extra heat, a lot of times. They'll take them, um, if you put them under a heat lamp first, you can actually try to take uh, one of the ones from the heat lamp, put it in the, like put it in the tub and then close it in the tub with the snake. A lot of times that'll actually do it. As a matter of fact, I've been doing that lately here and it seems like it's been working really well. I go through my whole collection and a lot of the snakes won't actually eat this time of the year, right in the middle of the breeding season. And I'll take all my leftover rodents, put them under the heat lamp and then I'll kind of slip them in all the snakes that haven't eaten and leave them in there for about half an hour. And I'll have about half of them actually eat those snakes in, kind of in the tub in the dark, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you can also try live too, but a lot of people frown on live. It's kind of a last resort. Or you could try like a live mouse or a live rat, like a live African sofa or something like that. Or, you know, so a lot of times you can actually get them stuck on like live mice. So, so I'd probably use that like as a last resort. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. How long does your ball python go off of feed after laying? So sometimes the females can go for a really long time off of food after laying eggs. And sometimes it's months and months and months. And sometimes they'll go back on food the same week that they lay. As a matter of fact, with my clown female, it seemed like right after she laid the eggs, it was like two days after she laid, she started eating again, which is kind of crazy. So it really depends on the female. And a lot of times when they lay eggs, you can actually give them a little bath and kind of wash all the scent off of them. You can change all the substrate and kind of mix things up as far as that goes. So what you really want to do is get them from continually to coil up in the back of the tub because a lot of times they think they're still sitting on eggs and incubating those eggs and you kind of want to snap them out of that as soon as you can to get them back on food. All right, let's see, let's see. We're about, still about 20 questions behind. <laughs> All right, have you ever covered any of the falling morphs in your videos? Raven, Odium, Quake, Arcane, Mackenzie, or Huffman? No, I actually haven't covered any of those genes. Someone is on top of what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. There's like a whole list of a lot of stuff that I haven't covered yet. 
And it seems like on a lot of my morph videos, they really don't do that well compared to, you know, like the top 10 recessive or something like that. Or if I do like a tour of my reptile room or my snakes here in my collection. So I can't do too many morph videos because my whole channel starts slowly tanking. I think people kind of get tired of it, but those are definitely on my list as genes to do in the future. All right, let's see. What effect does ambient room temperature fluctuations have on feeding? Yeah, so I did notice it seems like uh, if I actually change my ambient room temperature, even if I increase it or decrease it slightly, it seems like a lot of my ball pythons will go off of food from a change in my ambient room temperature. So you want to pretty much keep it as stable as possible. I keep it here, I'd say anywhere from like, like, uh, like 77, 78 as far as the minimum, all the way up to about 82 degrees as far as my ambient temperature. Yes, I'm still on. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Joseph Hayes. All right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I thought I'd do live streams on the weekend. As a matter of fact, I started doing like one hour live stream just Saturday and Sunday. I thought, you know, I'm going to go to an hour and a half. And then some people kind of coaxed me into going like two and a half hours to three hours. I think I'm the pretty much the longest I'm going to go is about three hours. It looks like we're at two hours and 14 minutes right now. Maybe I'll go maybe another 15 minutes on the live stream. We still have 72 people, which is pretty amazing. Usually if I get down to like, you know, like 40, <laughs> 45 people on the live stream, we're like, all right, I'm going to cut it now. But usually if there's like still, you know, 70 or 80 people, I just keep going on the live stream. Since everybody's here, I might as well keep going until my voice goes on. <laughs> and then that'll be pretty much it. All right, let's see. I remember, let's see. Brianna Boley, I remember you mentioning you were able to buy a collection of ball pythons. How often does an opportunity like that pop up? So it's it's kind of interesting when I bought that collection of ball pythons. I bought it from a guy that knew a guy that knew another guy. So it was kind of like through the grapevine that I heard someone had some ball pythons for sale. As a matter of fact, the, the guy that I was that I heard it from was a guy that I normally sold rodents to. At that, at that time, I was actually taking a lot of my frozen rodents and I was selling them to some of the local people. As a matter of fact, we'd meet at the uh, at the bus station where the, uh, the like the Greyhound buses would meet like up here in the mountains, like in the big parking lots. And I'd exchange the rats. Sometimes he'd bring a snake and I'd buy a snake and I'd sell him some rats. And then he just kind of randomly told me about the, the collection of ball pythons that somebody knew, knew somebody else that had a whole collection. He was getting out of the ball python breeding business. And it was a pretty awesome deal. Apparently, he bought a bunch of snakes. He raised them up for three years, never bred any of the females. They were all three years old. He had males and females. And I was like, I'm going to buy every single female that this guy had. And he had like eight or nine females that were three years old. And pretty much all of them produced that very first year. And that's what really kick-started my ball python breeding operation like crazy. It was a, it was a, I'd say it's pretty much a once-in-a-lifetime <laughs> deal to actually get that many females all at once. It was pretty amazing. All right, Colton, my buddy at work, had been out of the service for five years every now and then. and catch him sitting around and smoking. <laughs> Attention on deck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can have flashbacks to the old military days, depending on what's going on. Yeah. All right. Straight heated is feeding my hatchling every four days bad. She's taking frozen thawed rat pumps with no problem. No, you can actually feed a hatchling every even three to four days. You can really grow a hatchling by feeding it, uh, you know, two to three times a week. You definitely can do that with hatchlings. Uh, let's see. I've heard of bull python hitting in the wall and stop eating at up to a thousand grams. So yeah, they have the so-called thousand gram wall. And I'd say that usually happens anywhere between 800 grams and about 1200 grams, where for whatever reason, they'll just be like eating like crazy. And then they'll just stop and won't eat for months and months, which is kind of frustrating. Bango plays. Hi, Chris. How is it going? 
Snake Eyes says, keep your project secret. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people do keep their projects secret. I don't really do it. So as a matter of fact, I actually took my albino pie and I bred it to my clown and I produced those triple head albino pie and clowns. And a lot of people would actually take a project like that and keep it secret. And they wouldn't let it known until they started, you know, they actually raised those snakes up and started breeding them together because it's one of the, it's a pretty awesome project that not a lot of people are really doing. And you can get the jump on every other person if you actually have a really awesome project and don't tell anyone about it. And they get a few years ahead of everyone and then nobody can catch up to your project which is a lot of reason that a lot of people keep a lot of your projects secret. But here in my ball python collection, you know, I'm mainly doing it kind of, you know, I guess kind of as a hobby to support my YouTube channel. So I don't really have, you know, any top secret projects that I wouldn't share here in my collection. I only have, you know, I can only fit like 150 snakes here in my collection. So I'm not really that big of a breeder. Uh, let's see. Raven is going up in price. That is interesting. Raven. So sometimes you'll actually find a gene where someone will take it and mix it in with clown or something like that. And they'll make like Raven clowns. I don't know if they've actually made it, you know, something like that. But sometimes you get one of these lesser known genes, work it into clown or something, make some amazing combinations. And then that gene just really explodes and everybody wants it. And the price goes up really high. Uh, see you says, what is the brand of tubs you have? I actually have, uh, these are all ARS caging racks made by arscaging.com, which is pretty much the most expensive rack you can get. I'd say pretty much any rack here in my collection, like the one right behind me, they're like anywhere from 2000 to about $3,000, even more than that per rack, which is kind of crazy. It's super expensive. But they really hold their price really well. And if you actually decided to sell the racking systems, you could pretty much recoup most of your money. Uh, is there any way I can send you a picture of my ball python so you can tell me the exact morph? Not sure the place I bought it from. Pretty sure it's a butter. So what you can actually do is, what I would do is if you have a snake and you want some identification, <clears throat> you could actually take a short little video, post it on YouTube, and then uh, just uh, leave a comment under any of my videos and say, hey, check out this link for uh, this snake and see if you can help me identify it. And then, so, so all the comments with links will actually get held and I have to go in and approve them. I'll approve that and then check it out. And then I'll make a comment on your video and say, yes, I think it might be this gene or a combination of certain genes. So, so let me tell you, if you actually have a complete unknown, you don't know what genes were in the parents or anything like that, <clears throat> and you're just trying like from scratch to identify genes that can be pretty tricky to do but i can give it a shot hey we got another super chat all right thank you <clears throat> all right so let's go down to the super chat question the schmogly <laughs> i don't know if i said that right Thanks, Chris. Your vids have helped me more than any others in this journey. Cheers from the North. Thank you. Yeah, that is my goal with my channel. Kind of making a different channel than anyone else. Mostly, you know, about the genetics education as far as the ball pythons. I kind of geared more towards beginner breeders as far as what I'm doing. A lot of times, a lot of people, you know, there's certain breeders that'll just do kind of like the high-end combinations. Look at the new combinations I'm making. I'm trying to looking, you know, a lot of this is actually kind of the basic groundwork that I cover to kind of help the new people in the hobby. <clears throat> so it looks like we're at two hours, 21 minutes. <laughs> Going uh, 12 hours. <laughs> All right. My butter corglo is my best eater as far as ball goes. He is a pig. Yeah, so I found the coral glows can be pretty good eaters. Lessers or butters can even be better. It's probably the butter in that combination that really is the probably the better eater. It seems like bamboos are even the most aggressive feeders when it comes to feeding them. And usually when you have a, a really good eater, it can, it, let me tell you, it can be kind of discouraging when you actually get up to like the thousand gram wall or they go on a really long fast. 
and they can pretty much overnight turn from your, the best eater in your whole collection to the worst eater. And you just have to kind of expect that with ball pythons. Please keep up the morph videos. Yes, I definitely will. <laughs> I'm always looking for something new, some new combinations or something that I haven't covered as far as doing some of the morphs. What I really like in the morph videos, instead of doing like one gene, I really like the combinations, like the five or six gene combinations where I can actually cover each, especially if they're really different genes, like one gene from the blue-eyed leucistic, one gene from the black-eyed leucistic, one gene from the spider complex in a combination. Then when I do a video, I'm actually covering all the different combinations in one video where someone new can actually learn a lot from that video. I really like those because it's, I think, a lot more educational than just doing like a, like a simple combination. I've been watching your videos religiously. Thank you, Brett F. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see, where do you get your information regarding the morph genes? Yeah, so it's, it's so as far as the information, I pretty much just learned it along the way. So it's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> a lot of, if you actually look back way at my early stuff, uh, a lot of times I would make a lot of mistakes. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for example, I would actually, when I first started out, I'd say, all right, the leopard doesn't change the color. The leopard only changes the pattern in my combinations. And then people would chime in and say, no, 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 the leopard is actually a dark gene. <laughs> and a lot of the comments would correct me and kind of, you know, fix it along the way. And then a lot of times on uh, my earlier videos, I would say, all right, a blue-eyed leucistic, you breed two genes together, you'd always get the white snake. And then I realized, well, there's gene, there's combinations you know, like the Purple Passion and the Mystic Potion and some of the combinations that were blue-eyed leucistics, but they weren't completely white. So let me tell you, along the way is I made a lot of mistakes in a lot of my videos. And a lot of times you actually can't go back in and cut out those sections because it would kind of interrupt the whole flow of the video. So a lot of my information from like three years ago was not 100% correct. I definitely learned along the way. All right, let's see. T and J reptiles. I'm trying to tame down my GHI ghost. I've had him for about four months and he is still jumpy. Any tips? Yes. Yeah, so, so for any, uh, any ball python that's really jumpy, I just handle them a lot more. Maybe put them around your neck. You can actually do like maybe half hour, 45 minutes a day around your neck to really tame them down. Or if they're a smaller ball python, just handle them a lot more. Uh, what's your most anticipated clutch this year? So one of the ones that I really want to go, I'm actually breeding my pastel Enchi Desert Ghost male to, <clears throat> to my pastel spider Desert Ghost female, which I've been breeding that female for like four years now. This is her fifth year. And I hope they actually, <laughs> I hope she actually lays eggs this year. She is driving me crazy to get a whole clutch of visual Desert Ghosts with the pastel and the super pastel, that would be pretty amazing. All right, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, fifth time asking, can anyone see my question? Uh, so Sheila, what is going on with Sheila? Uh, that's like the second time you said, can anyone see your question? But I don't see your question. I don't know what's going on. So I don't know. It seems like uh, uh, there's, uh, I think I actually have moderators from YouTube deleting some of these comments and questions. Sometimes I'll actually see like a comment pop up and it'll disappear. So depending on what you're actually asking, some of your uh, comments may get automatically deleted or screened out by the YouTube moderators. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe try rewording your question. I don't know what's going on with that. All right, are your racks ARS or Freedom Breeder? All my racks are from ARSCaging.com. Uh, Freedom Breeder, I don't know. The, they're pretty much, I'd say they're pretty much on par with each other, the Freedom Breeders and the ARS. They're both pretty much almost the same price point, pretty much the best racks that money can buy the ARS and the Freedom Breeder. 
Although if Freedom Breeders started giving me free racks, I would definitely be open to promoting their product as well. <laughs> if Freedom Breeders is actually listening to this live stream. But nobody no normally gives me free product here in my operation. All right, let's see. Uh, All right, Corbin. Hey, Chris, I recently rescued, purchased a female albino pie that was born in August 29, 2020. She's currently weighing 120 grams. Any tips to get her to a healthier weight? I thought she was rather small. So, yeah, 120 grams from August of... 2020 august september october november december january february march five six, seven months at 120 grams yeah you could probably um that seems pretty small for a hatchling that's you know almost half a year over half a year old so i would probably start feeding maybe twice a week maybe three times a week if it's a little bit stubborn you can at 120 grams you can almost go back to like live mouse hoppers on that one. If it'll take frozen thawed, I'd probably do like a frozen thawed mouse hopper or get it on frozen thawed rats. If it's actually on rats, I'd probably double up, maybe do at least two rodents a week to get some more weight on that one. I'd say it probably could be, you know, like three, it could probably be like 300 to 350 grams at about that age. So you could definitely increase the feed on that one. Uh, let's see. What other breeders do you follow and like? <laughs> Good question. So there's a whole bunch of pretty much any ball python breeder on YouTube. I actually follow and watch all this stuff. So I'm actually subscribed to like, uh, I think it's over 700 channels over on YouTube and most of them are reptile channels. As a matter of fact, I can actually come over here and look at how many channels I'm at if I'm still live. <laughs> it says I'm live now. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> My computer freaked out. I thought the live stream was dead, but it looks like we're still back, still in the same spot here. Wow. All right. <laughs> we lost a bunch of people on the way, too. I think we lost about 30 people on that one. I actually came over here. I opened up another tab. I was going to go back to YouTube. Look at how many channels I'm subscribed at. And the whole thing just crashed. It actually disconnected and then reconnected midstream, which I didn't even know it could do that. Reconnect to the stream that it disconnected from, which was crazy. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so up here, we actually have a really super slow internet. Uh, it, it actually goes through my phone line. As a matter of fact, most people up here in the mountains of Colorado, they can't even get, like, natural gas, which is pretty crazy. Most people are on propane, and we're, like, way out in the middle of nowhere. You can't get cable. You can't get anything. I tried satellite inter internet for a while, and the problem is, is it snows so much up here in the mountains that every time it snows, I lose my internet. There's no way I can do like a live stream when it's when I'm doing satellite. I get a faster connection, but we keep getting cut off. So I'm just going through the phone line. We're at like two megabits per second, which is kind of crazy. So yeah, it looks like uh, we're starting to gain some people back that we lost from that one. That was crazy. But anyway, uh, the question was, what other breeders do you follow? I'm, yeah, I'm subscribed to like... I think it's like 740 different channels here on YouTube. As a matter of fact, you can actually go to my YouTube channel and then click on my, ch I think it's the channels tab on my page over on YouTube, like on my main page. And it'll actually show you all the different channels that I'm subscribed to. And probably about, I'd say about 80% of them are all reptile channels. So anyone who's breeding ball pythons, as a matter of fact, most of those people, I'm looking for video ideas for most of them. That's kind of how I started. I don't really do that too much anymore as far as video ideas. Every now and then, I'll kind of borrow someone's idea for a video. But I'm trying, it seems like anymore, I'm trying to do videos that nobody else has made, trying to add something new to the reptile community. That's why I do a lot of the combination videos and the morph videos. And like a lot, a lot of the new gene videos from the new genes from Europe and stuff like that, I try to cover that because nobody on YouTube has covered any of those genes. So I'm trying to add more stuff to YouTube versus just copy 
what everybody else is doing on YouTube. So anyway, yeah, that could, I can't believe the whole thing crashed and we're back. It looks like we got back all the 70 plus people that were on the stream. It was like completely crashed and disconnected, which is kind of crazy. Uh, I am blind. Wow. What would be the rest reptile for a blind person? So that's kind of interesting. I said, you know, if you were blind and you're looking at all the different genes in ball pythons, it would be pretty much nothing would be different. They would all feel the same because you wouldn't see any differences between the morphs. So it'd be kind of interesting with that uh, with that situation. So, you know, being blind, probably, you know, I think a ball python would be pretty awesome because they're really a hands-on animal and they're really super soft and they don't move very much. And if you actually can't see the snake, you could probably get uh, like a normal ball python for really cheap. <laughs> you, you wouldn't really care about the color of the morph or anything. You could probably pick one up for you. You probably pick up a normal for like, you know, 20 bucks at a reptile show, anywhere from like 20 bucks to 50 bucks. So I would think probably the best hands on would definitely be a ball python if you wanted something to touch and feel. Uh, I don't really know of any other reptile that would be as hands-on and not as squirrely. You know, some of those snakes can be pretty squirrely. I would think a ball python would probably be the best. Uh, what morphs go great with Enchi? Good question. Tiffany Clark. Yeah, so, so the Enchi is actually a pattern-enhancing mutation, and in some Enchis, It'll actually bring a lot of yellow or orange into your combinations. So kind of on the, the pattern enhancing side of the Enchi, you can actually mix it with other pattern enhancing genes. So you can mix it with, so for example, uh, you could do, uh, one of my favorites is the banana Enchi. You could do the leopard or the spot nose or the confusion with the Enchi makes some really amazing combinations. You could do the super Enchi with any of those too. And with certain lines of Enchi, they, they bring in a lot of brightness. With certain lines, sometimes the Enchis, some of them don't bring in a lot of colors, but some of them do. <clears throat> and with the ones that are really bright, you can mix them with the brightening genes, like the pastel, the yellow belly, or the orange dream to make some really amazing bright combinations. <laughs> All right. Hey, just got here. What is magic in my name? What is going on? Yeah, we've been going for <laughs> two hours and 36 minutes. Still have 74 people. 109 thumbs up. Awesome. Thank you for the thumbs up. Yeah, hit the thumbs up. I usually don't ask. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it really makes a difference if you hit the thumbs up or not on that. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know. With these live streams, it doesn't seem like a lot of people really watch a lot of the replays compared to like some of my morph videos. It seems like a lot of people would rather see like the, the educational videos as far as getting like the long term views on my channel. All right, let's see. Uh, riddle, riddle me this Batman F. That's an interesting username. Almost sounds like a, like a comic book or something. <laughs> Would it be possible to breed a blue-eyed Lucy with a black-eyed Lucy and would the clutch still be all white? So, so no, as far as I know, if you took a black-eyed leucistic, which would be uh, either a super fire or a super sulfur, and then you bred that to a blue-eyed leucistic, which would be two genes in the blue-eyed leucistic, like a super bamboo or a bamboo lesser, or a lesser Mojave or something like that. I don't think there's any way you can actually get an all white snake out of that combination unless you had other genes in the mix that would give you an all white snake. <clears throat> <coughs> all right, let's see. Yeah, we're pretty far back in the questions here. All right. <clears throat> All right, what do you think about the Florida ban on stuff? Yeah, that's crazy. So people were saying in the last live stream yesterday that they were banning ball pythons and boa constrictors and a bunch of stuff like that in Florida, which is kind of crazy. I didn't know they actually passed anything like that until yesterday. 
Are the super fires an all right morph? Yes, the super fires. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I was to get an all white snake just as a pet ball python, I would probably get a super fire or maybe even a super sulfur. The super sulfurs actually have a little bit more yellow, sometimes a really bright yellow on the top of a bright white snake with the black eyes. So yeah, there's no genetic defects. Nothing can really break through a super fire as far as I know. So they'd all be really bright white with a little bit of yellow on the top of them. Uh, let's see. What's the purpose of putting a chip in a snake? I know some breeders have that option. Yeah, so... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's required in some places where you actually have to microchip your snakes, but it's kind of like it's kind of like a dog where you put a microchip in there and then you bring it to the vet and then they scan for the microchip. And then when they scan it, they can actually see like all the information like the breed or whatever information you want that you put on that microchip, usually like the name of the owner as far as that. But as far as snakes, like microchipping a ball python <laughs> you know it's like what are the odds that your ball python's going to get out and then escape the house and then someone's going to find it and wonder whose ball python it is pretty unlikely that someone would find a wild ball python where a microchip would come into play you know most of them are pretty much just like in a reptile room or something like that maybe if you're like in florida and there's a hurricane and it wiped out everybody's houses and knocked over all of your racks or something like that, and you're trying to figure out whose snake's there. Maybe in that case, I could see microchips trying to sort everything out. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, didn't know people were chipping snakes. Not very common to microchip a ball python. Yeah, Colton, smash that like button, subscribe, comment in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the support. Yeah. Uh, pretty much the big thing. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So a lot of people say, yeah, hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. And then they end up with a lot of subscribers, but they really don't get the views long-term and really the views are the things that, that really pays off on my YouTube channel. So I don't really have many subscribers compared to a lot of the bigger channels, but I have more views. And since I get more views, I get more ads, and I pretty much make a living on the ads from the views. The subscribers doesn't really pay me anything, so. <laughs> but, but yeah, you can subscribe if you want. I usually don't ask to subscribe, but you can. Uh, that snake is chilling, yeah. So this is Bubble, probably my mellowest ball python, even more mellow than Bobby. She'll sit here for hours and hours on my neck. And she won't try to get away. She's like the super friendliest snake in my collection. Dan E, hey, I didn't know you were live. Yes, yeah, so we've been live for two hours, 41 minutes. All right, so I'm gonna go for 19 more minutes and we'll call it at three hours. Because, mainly because I have to make another video for tomorrow after I get done with this. <laughs> I wanna do, uh, I think I wanna do, uh, eight reptile room hacks for a video. I'll show you some of the hacks that I do, some of the shortcuts and stuff that I do here for, you know, making things easier in the reptile room. Where is Bobby? He's in timeout. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna switch. We'll do Bobby for the last 20 minutes. Instead of Bubble, Bubble has been, ugh. Bubble's a chunker. Look at that snake. She is really huge. <laughs> I'm breeding her this year. I think she might go, but, she is still developing some follicles. So she's, she hasn't ovulated yet. So I think I'm pretty safe to hold her for the live streams until she ovulates. And then I pretty much won't hold her anymore. All right, let's get Bobby. <clears throat> All right, Bobby. Oh. Ooh, Bobby messed up his tongue. Ooh. All right. <laughs> I'm going to have to clean Bobby's tub when I get done. Looks like he made a, a mess in the back corner. All right, this is Bobby, my bamboo ball python. Eight-year-old bamboo male. I need you to do a Huffman video. Yeah, so I've had Huffman on my list for quite a while. I actually have this list of all these. As a matter of fact, someone actually mentioned all these morphs 
that uh, I haven't done yet. And there was like, I think there's probably like two dozen morphs that I haven't done yet. Uh, but yeah, Huffman is definitely on my list and one of the ones to do. All right, Dan E, I'm thinking about pairing a GHA Mojave with my lesser Mojave. But should I look for a pastel or a fire? I don't know if my blue eyed leucistic has other hidden, hidden genetics. So, so it really depends what you're going with. So, um, <clears throat> so if you have a GHI Mojave and you breed it with a lesser Mojave, you will get uh, super Mojaves. You will get lesser Mojaves, and then you'll get half 50% of everything will be GHIs. You'll get GHIs. You'll also get normals. And probably if you have other genes in with that combination, you'll also probably prove them out. So I, I would actually probably just do that pairing and you'll definitely prove out your, your snake and you'll probably see, I don't know, other genes in with the GHI. If you have other genes in with that blue eyed leucistic, you'll probably prove it out with that pairing. Uh, video idea, electricity. Did you have to beef up your power in your snake room? <laughs> How many heat panels can fit on one outlet? So yeah, so I kind of had a problem here in my reptile room with the power, mainly because I'm running uh, a space heater for the heat over here. I'm running an air cleaner over here uh, just to circulate a lot of the air. I am running my swamp cooler over here for humidity. I also have... Uh, uh, so I have some room lights in here. I also have a couple of papaya plants in here that are running on some grow lights over here in the corner. And I have all my racks with all the heat panels. As a matter of fact, I actually uh, kind of exceeded the circuit and I had to take some of this stuff, run it on an extension cord and run it to another circuit over in the other room. So yeah, I didn't really upgrade it. I just ran some of it on an extension cord to another thing. I think one of the things that kind of pushed me over the edge was the space heater in here, heating this room. And it doesn't really come on a whole lot. It just comes on a little bit to heat it up to between like 77 to 80 degrees. I say most of the time, the space heater and the swamp cooler are not actually running all the time. Uh, biggest 2021 goal. Yeah. So uh, my goal this year, since I'm not working my day job is to produce enough snakes to pay the bills. <laughs> Still kind of, you know, coming out of that phase where I'm getting away from my day job and doing this full time between YouTube and selling snakes. So I think it's going to do pretty good this year, but you never know what your snakes are going to do in any one year. If you'd have a really bad year, you know, technically, if you're just breeding snakes and you had a really bad year, you might have to go back to your day job. <laughs> that would be that would be kind of the hardest thing, breeding snakes full time. All right, let's see. Yeah, I'm still way behind on these questions. I don't think we're going to make it. We got about 15 minutes left for the three hour mark. Uh, let's see. Uh, I looked at a snake at a pet shop. It was moving its head left to right pretty rapidly. Hmm. So if a snake moves its head left to right, uh, it could potentially be like a spider or something like that, like a champagne where it could have a little bit of head wobble. I've actually seen some diseases where you could potentially have a head wobble in the non-spider morph. So you kind of have to watch for that too. But yeah, when it comes to anything like that, <clears throat> if you see anything weird in the pet shop, or I'd definitely ask the person that's selling it to see if they know anything about the kind of the weird head movement or just avoid buying a snake like that in the first place. What is Palumbo going to do since he lives in Florida? Wow, he lives in Florida. Uh, yeah, I didn't know he lived in Florida. That is crazy. Yeah, thank goodness that I don't live in Florida with all those new rules and regulations. <clears throat> so in fact, I was reading somewhere that I think Florida is going to have a list of species that you can keep. And if it's not, if you're, the snake that you have is not on that list, then you can't keep that snake. And as far as what I've heard, that list is going to be all Florida native species, which is kind of crazy. It pretty much cuts out the whole reptile industry 
I don't know if that's actually what's really going on, but that is pretty scary. What's going on over in Florida? <clears throat> Jasmine, I'm still on live. Yes, <laughs> I've been on live for a while now. Yeah, it's been two hours and 48 minutes. I'm going three hours. So we got about 12 minutes left here on the live stream. It's been kind of crazy. Doing a little bit longer lives uh, lately on the weekends. Uh, let's see. How many times has that snake bitten you? <laughs> so this one and the one that I had, they, neither one of them has ever bit me. Bobby's never tried to bite me. The only time that Bobby's drawn blood is one time he was around my neck and I kind of reached back when he was yawning and I got my hand right in the middle of a yawn and he was drawn. He's made me bleed pretty good, which is kind of crazy. Uh, what type of snake is that? Is it friendly? So yeah, this one is a bamboo ball python, completely friendly. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Dan E., I live in Tennessee, had a random python show up in our yard once. It belonged to a neighbor up the road. Wow, that's crazy. So in Tennessee, I would imagine there's snakes all over the place, like wild snakes down in Tennessee. Dave Creed, love the videos. Thank you. Mary Fife, my Thor has the same personality as your Bobby. All right. <laughs> I remember Thor. I'm glad Thor is doing good. The bamboo ball python Thor. Is that a python? This is a python. I th although I think python is some kind of a computer something python. <laughs> I think it's a computer language or something, python. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you're willing to reveal this, I was wondering how much you make off of YouTube a month. I was looking to get into YouTube and I was wondering if it would be worth it. Thank you and all that you do. Yeah, so... Uh, when I when I started YouTube, <clears throat> I started making daily videos every single day, and for the first six months, I made zero dollars and zero cents, <laughs> putting out thirty videos a month for six months. It was absolutely brutal. And when I first got monetized on YouTube, the first day I made eighty cents, and the second day I made like seventy some cents. The third day, I think I made like 50 cents. So I was making like pennies every single day when I started YouTube. And I'd say probably, you know, well, I have about 1,200 videos on YouTube. And let me tell you, when it comes to YouTube, everybody's making a completely different amount on YouTube. As a matter of fact, if you actually go to a lot of these big reptile channels that have more subscribers than I do, they're not making as much money as I am. <clears throat> so I'm making pretty much... Oh, I'd say, you know, um, I'm technically, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say how much I make on YouTube, but <laughs> I guess I could share it here in the last nine minutes on this live stream. Who's going to come all the way to the end of the live stream, right, to see how much I'm making on YouTube? I'd say pretty much the average right now, I'm making about 2000 a month on the ads over here on YouTube. And pretty much my best month, I think I made about $3,100 in a month on YouTube. And that's just from the ads over on YouTube, which is kind of crazy. And then, <clears throat> of course, there's always, you know, I make, you know, the money from a whole bunch of different things. So I sell merchandise. You can actually set up merchandise once you reach a certain size. I make maybe $20 a month on merchandise, selling some merchandise. I make uh, maybe about $100 a month on Patreon. I think on channel memberships, I make about $30 a month or something like that. So it's, uh, let's say the ads are by far the number one. From the super chats here on my live stream, I do make, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars a month if I'm doing live streams every single weekend. That's really a big help as far as that. But you know, when I was working in the lab, I was making probably three or four times the money that I'm making now. So it was a huge shot going from big bucks working in the lab to jumping over here on YouTube, not making a lot. Let me tell you, most of the money that I'm depending on is from these ball pythons. And it's kind of seasonal too. So you get a bunch of money from your ball pythons, like within a few months. And then that money has to last throughout the year as far as the money. So yeah, so it really depends on YouTube 
sometimes you can have really bad months. As a matter of fact, it seems like in uh, certain months of the year, you make more money over on YouTube. As a matter of fact, uh, like uh, when you're coming up on Christmas, it seems like your ad money can almost double, which is kind of crazy. So like in October, November, December, your ad money goes up and up and up and up. And then you hit January. And then for some reason, it's like your uh, the average amount that you get per ad can be almost cut in half. So like in January, it just tanks where you're making like half the money that you were from the previous month. And then it slowly picks up over the year until you get down to the end of the year. So let me tell you, it can be a roller coaster. And then sometimes people have like a viral video. I've seen people where they're making like pennies. And then in one month, they're making like, you know, $10,000. And then it'll go back down in a couple months where they're making pennies again. So it can be a huge roller coaster over on on YouTube here. So it's kind of totally unpredictable and there's nothing you can really do except ride out the waves on YouTube. All right, so yeah, so that is that. Yeah, so looks like we got six more minutes here. We'll go for the full three hours. Brett F, thanks for the stream. Got to hit the sack. See you later. All right. What do you think of the Java Morph? I haven't done a video on the Java Morph yet. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah we're, yeah, we're like way behind on these questions. <laughs> I bought a new incubator from C-Server. How long before expecting eggs should I turn it on and bring it up to incubator? So what I did is I actually already turned on my incubator right now. So if you paired up like in mid-October and you're kind of on the same schedule, I would probably plug in your incubator. But what I'm actually doing now is I have the heat probe taped to the heat tape in my incubator and I'm moving around a temperature probe all through my incubator. And what I found is usually I just leave it at 90 degrees, but it seems like the temperatures pretty much throughout my whole incubator are like two degrees lower than my heat tape. So what I'm actually doing is I'm turning it up to 92. And then when I move my temperature probe around the whole incubator, it seems like almost everywhere I'm getting a 90 degree hot spot throughout my whole incubator, which is kind of interesting. Uh, is, an, is an ultrasound a must for breeders? No, I think an ultrasound is good to have. You can kind of check on things. But no, I don't think you really need an ultrasound for breeding ball pythons, unless you're like serious into breeding and you're breeding year round. You can maximize your production if you do like a year round breeding and always ultrasounding all your females like every single week. Some people are like diehard into like squeezing every egg out of every single snake. You can uh, increase your productivity with an ultrasound, but I prefer kind of the seasonal approach where I'll just, you know, pair up my snakes in the middle of October and then stop pairing them like in the middle of March and then just kind of hope for the best. And it seems like, you know, about half, 50% to about 80% of my snakes will lay eggs, which is pretty typical as far as what other breeders are getting to. Who is your biggest snake, says Alyssa Braden. So, yeah, so I actually have Lucy she is my reticulated python. She's an albino, 50% dwarf, which is pretty amazing. And she still weighs about 100 pounds. Uh, last time I weighed her, she was about, I think she's about like 85 pounds when I weighed her last. And she's probably had, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 rodents since. It's been a while since I weighed her. I'm thinking she's anywhere from probably 90 to 100 pounds now. She's a big snake. Oh, uh, let's see. U.S. Arc will tell you everything about the laws coming out. Yeah, so I actually went over to U.S. Arc and I was trying to figure out what was going on over in uh, uh, Florida. Uh, check it out. My uh, my laptop is down to 20% battery. We've been talking for so long, I'm starting to lose power in my laptop. <laughs> I don't know how much power is in my phone. I just realized I don't have my phone plugged in or my laptop. And we're coming up on three hours, which I think is pretty much the limit of each one. All right, so we'll go three more minutes. All right, let's see. Thank you for your advice the other day on the live stream. Sure, yeah. So I'm probably going to do more live streams every weekend on a Saturday and Sunday. Seems like it's been working 
pretty good. It's it's kind of a double-edged sword because my views are going way down, but I increase the amount of money, it seems like, because I'm making the super chats. So uh, I don't know. It seems like I'm getting the same amount of subscribers whether I do live streams or not. So you look at the analytics on YouTube and it's like, all right, is this hurting me or not? And it seems like, you know, the, the benefits are kind of uh, balancing out the pros and the cons. So it's, you know, I, I enjoy doing the live stream because I can answer everybody's questions that I normally can't get to in a lot of the comments. Uh, I live in New York and I hear soon won't be able to ship all animals. So I heard they were trying to pass something through in New York where you can't ship any reptile across the border in New York which is another absolute, it seems like it's getting more and more restrictive. New York and then Florida now, which is kind of crazy. I don't know if that one's actually passed or if that's just like a proposal on the table for New York. I think it's just proposed right now. Uh, what do you do if you have your heat mat set to 90, but when using the heat gun, it reads 82 or below on the substrate? So what I actually do in my tubs, I clear out all the substrate right on the hot spot and I have the snake sit directly on the plastic in the tub right above the hot spot. So I wouldn't go by the substrate because if you get it too hot underneath, you'll actually, if the snake burrows down underneath, it'll get too hot. You definitely don't want it too hot, but you can actually increase your heat mat above 90 if you need to increase the temperature of the bottom, the plastic part of your tub. I'd probably measure that as far as setting your temperatures. When are you gonna upgrade your camera for live? Yeah, <laughs> it's not my camera, it is my internet. My internet is really bad. And I haven't really found a way to upgrade it so far because we can't get better uh, internet up here in the mountains of Colorado. I pretty much have to go like a drive an hour down to Denver or something and get a little office space. To set up. I don't know if I want to do that or still do lives out of my house. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe when, uh, you know, Elon Musk does the satellite internet, I might do something like that. Of course, it always snows up here, so I don't even know if the satellite would work all the time. So it looks like we are at three hours. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, so yeah, so there's a few questions, maybe about 15 questions that I didn't answer. So those questions I'm going to get to next live stream next Saturday. I'll do another live stream next Saturday and Sunday. It'll be the same time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. <clears throat> I noticed my voice is starting to go out and I still need to do my video for tomorrow. So a lot of talking today on the live stream and doing the videos. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to close it here at three hours of live streams, which is pretty amazing. Thanks for all your comments. Thanks for all the super chats. And I will see you tomorrow. I'll definitely see you tomorrow. And then if you want to do, talk some more next weekend, we'll do some more questions in the live stream next Saturday. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.